Comes into this football game with a record of four and six. Indiana five, four and one. Hoping to win to go to a bowl game. We're at Memorial Stadium in Bloomington, Indiana for this afternoon's game. The weather may be a factor because it's talked about the deterioration of it later today. As we stand right now, we're cloudy at about 45 degrees. Rain to come later on. A chance of snow flurries. So we'll wait to see how that develops and how that affects this football game. Indiana to kick off, Purdue to receive. Back is Ernest Callaway. And number 34, Earl Coleman. Now Coleman receiving kickoffs, Jim, because of the injury to Corey Rogers. Rogers, the freshman and the second leading rusher on this football team, is out for today's football game. And Coleman is quick. We're ready to get it started. And we're underway at Memorial Stadium. Started off with the kickoff going out of bounds. So Purdue will start with good field position. Here's the series right here. Purdue leading 57-30 and 6. The last meeting last year at Ross Age Stadium, Indiana. A victor by two touchdowns, greatly because of Purdue's seven turnovers. IU did indeed capitalize. And the difference there, Mike, last year, Eric Hunter started at quarterback. Today, it is the youngster from Huntington, Matt Pike. Oh, boy, he ought to be feeling excited about this one. 11 for 22, 157 yards and a touchdown last week, coming in very quickly and relief of Eric Hunter. There's the numbers on the year. Three touchdowns, five interceptions. Purdue's first play from scrimmage. He'll get a couple up the middle, Jeff Hill. Jeff Hill's been running very well as of late, and the offensive line been kicking out when necessary. And as a result, this team is running the football, which it has not done in the past. Connors and Hill in the backfield, Jermaine Ross, Tedman Brown, and Scott Green at tight end. There you see Bob Dressel. He is the anchor. Chronopolis has also had a fine year, and Kevin Janiak on the Purdue offensive line. Second and eight. The give again. Right up the middle. And they will try to establish that today. Purdue's running game greatly improved. Jeff Hill on the carry. Yeah, la and last year, uh, Purdue against Indiana. Purdue had the run and shoot, which was more like run for your life because Purdue did no blocking, and Indiana forced the seven turnovers. Well, if you are going to run for your life, run away from Farrell and Bochamp. They've yeah, both been strong on the defensive line. There's a fine group of senior-driven linebackers hanging the rock on the defense. And the Indiana backfield, Damon Watts at free safety. Third and three for Purdue. Pike back to pass. Incomplete. Intended for Coleman, Hagen on the coverage for the Hoosiers. Mike, that was a good conservative game plan to begin with. You have a flag on the play, too. A couple of good runs to set up the short pass. Well-described situation for Indiana, but now, or for Purdue, but 
now with the penalty coming up. We'll see what transpires. Then they're talking to the Hoosiers. Farrell talking to the referee right now. All indications are the penalty is against IU. Should be a Purdue first down. We'll wait and see. Roughing the passer. Personal foul. Defense first down. So a big one. Roughing the passer. Called on the Hoosiers. They'll mark it off 15 yards. Purdue will pick up the football on the 43 of Indiana. Something Bill Mallory doesn't want to see early penalties. Indiana rushed six against Pike, tried to rattle him, tried to break up that short pass, and again the pass was dropped or maybe underthrown. Just the same, roughing the passer puts him in IU territory. First and ten on the 43. Left side and good penetration by the defense of the Hoosiers. The ball carrier, Jeff Hill. Paul Williams with the tackle. It's hard to believe that this football team in the last couple of seasons could not run the ball. What, worst in the NCAA, 57 yards a game at times. This year, a world of difference, and it's because of this guy. He came over from Ohio State and said, look, if you're going to win in the Big Ten, you must run the football. No ifs, ands, buts about it. That's what they're doing. Indeed, they have improved dramatically. Second and eight from the 41. Pike again goes right up the middle. So they're hammering away on it. Greg Farrell with the tackle. You see him right there, number 45. What a year Farrell has had. And it's good to see him playing because it was a question earlier in the week. Farrell suffering a slight sprain of the knee on Tuesday. He has six sacks. That's the team lead for one Greg Farrell. And in most cases, after an injury like that, you do sit out a week. But if you can play, you will because it is the bucket game. No game like it in the world. We'll talk about the coach's philosophies going into this a little bit later. Third and five. Big play right here for the Hoosiers. They don't want Purdue to get the early lead or get the drive going. Pike back to pass. Way far away from anybody. And you know what I noticed there, Mike? Pike had plenty of time. He had great blocking up front. Looks like there was good coverage in the defensive backfield because he had nobody to throw to, but he had the time to throw the football. I think that's important as this game goes along. That man right there, Jeff Hill, saw a lot of action early on. Scott McGowan back deep now. Purdue will punt for the first time this afternoon, and they've got a good punter. Eric Brune, the tops in the Big Ten. He has had a dandy year, has Brune. Averaging 42.6. He'll pooch it here. Wow. And a perfect pooch it is. Oh boy. And Indiana will take it on the two-yard line. Nice kick by Eric Bruni. Showed that he can kick it long with that great average. Showed why he's number one in the Big Ten right here, Jim. They have started to keep statistics in football for kicks inside the 20, which really shows you the value of your punter. This one's inside the five, and that's as good as it gets. So Indiana, they're calling it the one-yard line. We'll start. Trent Green under center. Vaughn Dunbar about eight yards back in the end zone. The give to Vaughn. Takes it out to about the six. Jim Schwantz on the tackle for Purdue. Here's how Indiana will line up offensively. And this is the Oak and Bucket game. Trent Green, what a year he has had. Todd Walker at the fullback position, the number two leading rusher in the nation. And Dunbar, Lewis, McGowan, and Coleman. Thomas Lewis has really had a fine year. Sean Harper, Todd Smith, Mac Newton, and Randy Schneider. Schneider at the right tackle position. Indiana second and five from the sixth. Just underway here at Memorial Stadium. And a scoreless football game. The pitch to Vaughn. Tackled from behind by Jeff Scazina. Neither team doing anything drastic right here. And it, that should be expected from Indiana. You must be conservative when you have the football inside your own tent. Here's the Boilermakers. Grace Ganina from Chicago. Man, is he a big nose guard. And Robert Harden. 
right there is your man to look for, Jim Schwantz. He is certainly the linebacker of extraordinary talents for Purdue. In the defensive backfield, they are stingy. Leading in the Big Ten in interceptions, Jimmy Young and Pat Johnson fine at the safety positions. Third and four for Indiana. Green. Sideline, find it. Jimmy Young on the tackle. Green found Burt Thornton. Or actually, Eddie Thomas out there. Thomas with the reception and the first down. Important for Indiana because off the fake, Green has the receiver on one-on-one -on -one coverage. Now, Purdue plays a lot of zone. They'll allow the short passes. They don't want to get burned, and they don't often get burned. But important for Indiana to get a first down there. Otherwise, they're punting from their own end zone. Eddie Thomas, 45 receptions. He is the leading Indiana receiver. He makes those kind of catches, the possession-type catches. First and 10 from the 21. Dunbar slashes, getting outside, gets a couple of blocks and a good gainer. Again, Schwantz on the play. Mike, the value of Vaughn Dunbar, well, I suppose we could spend about three hours talking about it. But Dunbar, even when you've got him contained, you see his numbers right there are very impressive. He's able to lower his shoulder pads right into you and pick up a couple of more yards. He is so strong that Purdue had said from the very get-go, it's a problem to find him. It's even more a problem to bring him down. Second down, two to go for the Hoosiers from their 29. Vaughn hit hard in the backfield. They found him. Yes, they did indeed. A big play by Eric Beattie. He came right through the line, put the initial hit on. Also there, number 75, Eric Gray. It's almost misleading that Purdue has given up so many points this year because they are playing good defense. Look at the penetration right there by Beattie. He's the first man to hit him, and then the Boilermakers just kind of lock on to him. 75, Eric Gray gets his big mitts around him and drops him for a loss, setting up, I guess, a passing situation on third and short. Third, we'll call it a long three on the 28. Uh-oh. Flag on the play. Somebody jumped. Looked like it came from the right side of the line. Might have been Scanina. Always nice of 52,000 home fans to help the officiating here, huh? Dead ball. Contact by the defense. Five-yard penalty. And what we've seen so far in this football game, Mike, is two penalties that have resulted in first downs. Green could have changed the snap count here, but Scanina, 6'2", 286 pounds, looks like the first guy to jump, and Vaughn Dunbar said first down. From the 33, Indiana's first possession of the afternoon. It started on the one-yard line. Green looking to pass. Can't complete it to Eddie Thomas on the right side. Now, you saw Thomas wide open by himself near side of the field. Coletto's defense is such that they will give up the short pass. They'll give up the run. What they say is, it's okay. Pick up a first down against us. Pick up a couple of first downs against us. But somewhere down the line, you've got to work to score against us. You've got to eat up some clock. And if you make a mistake, our secondary, as you alluded to earlier, will pick off a pass. And with the running game so important, here's Trent right here, his numbers. The running game so important for Purdue, they're looking to shorten the football game. Mm -hmm. Trent Green, pitch back to Vaughn. He'll get a couple. They did a pretty best. good job on Dunbar so far. Pat Johnson coming up from the free safety position to make the tackle. Mo Hackney, the defensive coordinator of Purdue, was telling me that he they don't care if Dunbar rushes for over 100 yards. What they're worried about is breaking the big play. Dunbar getting into the secondary and going all the way. If he gets 100 yards, he says, we can still beat Indiana. Second and eight on the 35. Purdue man jumped, but got back okay. Right over the middle, wide open. Andy Thomas for a big gainer. Pat Johnson again with the tackle. One of anchors in zone coverage, and that is the difficulty in trying to stop a third down play. Now Green drops straight back, and again, he's got the coverage open because they throw underneath that zone, and a man is wide open at midfield. And now they're in a Boilermaker territory. So the downside of that contained defense is what we just saw. And look at the time that he had back there in the pocket. And yep. a big reason is because of Chris Burns and Frank Komet, the two big men on the Purdue defensive line, out for the year. The two seniors, that hurt them tremendously. First and 10, Green back to pass. A little dump off to Dunbar. He breaks a tackle. He's past the 40, all the way down near the 35-yard line. 
Schwantz finally catching up to Vaughn Dunbar. And he is so dangerous because of those numbers. He's versatile. 25 receptions, 225 yards. Add that one, Jim. And the screen pass is one of Indiana's biggest weapons. And the Boilermakers are susceptible to the screen, beaten by Desmond Howard's touchdown screen weeks ago. And Dunbar, of course, is just like another receiver. You want to get him the football as much as possible. You know, and you talk about Desmond Howard and his soon-to-be Heisman Trophy winning season. He's already wrapped it up. Man, oh, man, if he could have only been off a little bit, Casey Weldon out of there. <laughs> this man certainly in the picture, Dunbar. First and 10 from the 36. Vaughn around the left side. Flag on the play. You know, something surprises me, Mike. I don't understand why Dunbar is not more in the Heisman picture. I mean, is it because of lack of exposure or lack of success on the part of Indiana? Because Dunbar is being considered by a number of the NFL scouts to maybe be the top one or two or third pick. You know, you're absolutely right, and it can't be because of a lack of strength of schedule when you look at the teams that Indiana has played, especially on the road this year. Here's the call. It's going to be against Indiana. That'll march them back to a first and 20 from the 46-yard line. And, you, you know, what we were talking about with Vaughn Dunbar, he certainly has put up the kind of numbers that you want. Wiggle hands, push in the back. Offense, 10-yard penalty, spot ball. Legal use of the hands called on the Hoosiers. Still with his high-powered offense, Trent Green can go the 20 yards at the three downs or less. Look for him to do a lot of play-action passing. He's very effective at hiding the football. He's very deceptive at it. And uh, while this is not a situation Indiana likes to be in, nonetheless, they can pick up the first down by eating away on, on certain carries and passes. Ball on the 47. They're going to call it now first and 21 for the Hoosiers. Green gives to Dunbar. Scanina pulls him down on the left side. They're going to double Scanina today, and they've got to. And they're able to, as most teams have been this year. And it's really kind of taken away from the productivity of a Jeff Scanina and almost a Jimmy Schwantz. Second in Big Ten in tackles for loss, still for Scanina, but you take out Komet and Burns, oh, yeah. and all of a sudden guys converge on him. He certainly has showed great, great pride this year for this Purdue program, being, as you said, Jim, double and triple teamed at all times this year. Second and 18. Hoosiers just inside Purdue territory. Boilermakers showing blitz. Green looking. Receiver overthrown. Good coverage back there by the Boilers. Boilermakers don't blitz very much. Coletto's philosophy again is to make you beat him by taking several plays to do so. But this time they send a few people, especially from the corner position to Green, being able to step in that pocket, avoids being sacked, but did not complete the pass. Good pressure there by Brian Thurman, the cornerback of the Boilermakers. A bundle to pick up here, third and 18. From the 45. 6.54 remaining in the first quarter, Green back to pass. Right up the middle, Whoa. just under thrown, had his tight end wide open. Trent didn't like that one. Rod Coleman was wide open, maybe one of the best tight ends in the Big Ten. But nonetheless, the Hoosiers will be forced to punt for the first time this afternoon. And it's something worth mentioning. Clock remaining 6.50 in the first period. Now look at the drive by Indiana, how long it took, and look what it netted. Nothing. This is right what Coletta wants. He wants Indiana and to force them into a game in which there isn't much time left on the clock, and it's close. The Julio back. His punt goes out of bounds, looks short. We're scoreless here at Memorial Stadium. The Boilers and Indiana playing for the old Oaken Bucket. We'll take a timeout. at the house 21 5 and 1 in Memorial Stadium but two years ago 
Remember, it was Purdue who beat them here and knocked them out of their trip to a bowl game. Purdue looking to be the spoiler again this afternoon on second and 10. The handoff. Fumble. Still a loose ball. Wow. And still loose. Callaway's got it. This? And he's going to go all the way for the touchdown. Wow. Man, oh, man. That's that lovely AstroTurf down there. How many bounces did that take? strange things happen in this bucket game and here is one of them Jeff Hill the ball carrier there is no way Indiana can't recover this ball you see four five six Hoosiers around it but when they can't get to it look who does and it's see you later here's the point after attempt misses so Purdue on the turnover. Turnover of turnovers, if you will. <laughs> Ernest Callaway takes advantage. Purdue takes the early lead, six to nothing. 5.43 remain in the first. What a Jim, you said it perfectly. It's a bucket game, and those kind of things seem to happen in football games like this. Here's the replay. This is on the highlight reel and television stations across the country tonight because it should be Indiana's ball. 44 for the Summer Hoosiers. All. Summerall right Watts. there. Watts should have had it. And Summerall goes again, and it's Hill that actually pushes it another time into the hands of Callaway. And 75 yards later, Purdue leads 6-0. You got to say something about that play right there, Jeff Hill, because he's the one who initially fumbled, showed the perseverance to go after the football. It turns into six for Purdue. Ernest Callaway, so swifty. Once he got a couple of yards away, it was forget about it. Watch the kick. It's going to be a short pooch. Fielded by the up back of the Hoosiers. Finally brought down at about the 37, and that brings up an interesting point because Indiana has been incredible, leading the Big Ten on kickoff returns this year with Vaughn Dunbar back deep, as well as Thomas Lewis. And for about the last three weeks, Jim, every team has kind of pooched. Iowa pooched to him, Ohio State pooched to him. They're not kicking to Vaughn Dunbar back there. And you know, in a way, sometimes that backfires because look at the field position of Indiana. At the 37, great spot to open the lineup. Mill Ballerine Company can operate from there. Sometimes that backfires. Dunbar can't run back everyone. That's right, or Matt Hansen. He? Yeah, well, he might be able to. <laughs> That's what things are thinking. Matt Hansen there. Hoosiers will start it off at the 36, trailing six to nothing. Give to Vaughn up the middle. Good blocking. Number 26, Vaughn Dunbar, the ball carrier. Play made by. Looks like Beatty in there. Beatty and Schwanz get credit for the tackle. Here's the replay on it. Getting the surge from the Indiana front for the Boilermakers led by Scanina will try to stop that man today. Now Dunbar gets six on the play, but Coletto doesn't mind as long as he can force Indiana to keep them away from the big play. There's big Jeff Scanina. Man in motion. Right side, Dunbar cuts back. Up to about the midfield mark. This is kind of a bend but not break type of defense, Mike, where they're going to give up a lot of yards. That's okay as far as they're concerned. The, the concern on the part of Purdue is to keep you off the scoreboard. And if they force you to go seven or eight minutes and you come away with three points, or as Indiana did on the last drive with nothing, mission accomplished. 
One thing we haven't seen yet, which I'm sure we will see as the day progresses, Trent Green running the football. He is indeed the second leading rusher on this football team. There's Vaughn's numbers, eight carries, 32 yards. Average of four a carry. Trent to pass. Right got side, man. got a man, Lewis, and he's got it. What a terrific fake to Vaughn Dunbar. And they got the one-on-one -on -one coverage. And on AstroTurf, this man is a burner. Of course, he's a burner just about anywhere, but particularly on the turf where you get that extra spring. Green off the fake, gets the single coverage, and leads it perfectly. Thomas Lewis has come in this year, Jim, and done exactly what Bill Mallory had hoped he's become the big play threat. Yep. Great speed, showed it right there. Second on the team in receiving, 37 catches, five touchdowns. Green and the Hoosiers will start from the 11, first and 10. Flags all over the place. I think some buddies jumped on that <laughs> one, didn't they? Quarrel. Hey, Mike, they're watching at the clubhouse today in the city south side of Indianapolis. Pete Richards and company, a lot of Indiana fans there. Going to be called on Indiana. Not too happy, though, with what they've seen so far. Let's take a look at it. It's on the right side of your screen, folks. There's the movement right there. Looked like it was Jim Hannon, the left guard, the 6'2", 285 junior from Naperville. So Indiana will come back from the 16th, first and 15. Dunbar will get one, maybe two. Jim Schwantz again on the tackle. Boilermaker's doing a nice job of gang tackling Vaughn Dunbar. Of course, they force him to the near side of the field. That's the way Indiana ran on that particular play. And just made sure that everybody was going with him. And Dunbar will be shadowed upon occasion today. And they just want to make sure that he doesn't find a way into the secondary where all he has to do is beat a safety. Second and 14. Purdue jumped. They were showing blitz. I think they might have got caught offside. We'll wait to see the call. Also on the far side and Indiana's offensive line, one of their players moved too, so we'll see which way it goes. Boilermakers thought it was against Indiana, but we'll wait and see. Dead ball. Ball start. It goes against the Hoosiers. On the tight end, number 84, Rod Coleman. Uh, Indiana going the wrong way right now. Second and 24 from the 25. Indiana penalized four times for 35 yards. No yellow flags thrown on the Boilers to this point in the game. 351 remaining in the first quarter. Purdue leads it six to nothing. Green, good protection, has time. Goes left side, incomplete. Indiana is the most penalized football team in the Big Ten, and this has been a problem for the Hoosiers. They've got this high-octane offense, but inside what they call the red zone, when you get into scoring territory, they have really shot themselves in the foot, and this is a reason this football team is not around 7-3 and three or maybe 8-2 and two at this point. That and turnovers. Mm -hmm. They are worst in the Big Ten with turnovers. The plus-minus is very minus for Indiana, unfortunately, for the IU fans. Eddie Beatty, the intended receiver on that last play, good coverage by Pat Johnson. Third and 19, we might as well call it third and goal, or we're going to be looking at Scott Bunnell here. They've got to get to the one for a first down. This is an important play here for Indiana. They would love to get right back in it. Green back to pass. It's going to need a little dump off to Dunbar. He's got some blockers. Getting around the left side. Brought down at about the 10. Pushed out of bounds. By Roman Bataille. That's a good safe call. And if Dunbar had received maybe another block or two on the far side of the field, might have been able to spring it. What it does do, it sets up Bunnell for the field goal after being third and long. And this is where Purdue, again, is susceptible, and Indiana able to gain half of the, the distance back that they had lost previously, and that sets up a chance to cut into the deficit. 
they'll spot the ball on the 10, which will make it a 27-yard field goal attempt. Bunnell is three for three from 20 to 29-yard range. The third leading scorer in IU history. Kick away. Got it. Indeed he did. Indiana has cut the lead in half, 6-3 on the field goal by Scott Bunnell. With 3.33 left in the old Oak and Bucket game, Purdue 6, Indiana 3. big right there to all our fans in the satellite audience watching all over the country. That's a big stop for Purdue when you get first and goal on the 11, first and 10 on the 11. Indiana hurt itself with the penalties though. That's happened a lot this year. Shooting themselves in the foot. Can't have any of that. Averaging 430 yards a game on offense. At the end. Wow. That's second in the Big Ten. They're second in the Big Ten in offense and defense. Both teams on the scoreboard, 333 remaining in the first quarter. Bunnell to kick off. Back deep, Callaway. He's the dangerous one, and that's who this football is going towards. Callaway from his own four. Past the 20. He'll get out to about the 26. Jason Orton with the special teams play, the tackle of Ernest Callaway. He is fleet of foot. Purdue's leading receiver. Coming into today, 20 catches for 362 yards, three touchdowns, averaging 18 yards per catch. And Mike, look at this lineup. Junior, junior, sophomore, sophomore, junior, junior, freshman, freshman. I mean, hey, in a, in a year or two, these guys are gonna be fighting for a bowl game. Jim Coletto would take that in a year or two also. He has done a tremendous job this year. Fight to pass right up the middle, short. Well, for the first time this afternoon, Matt was looking to pass. Bill Mallory says about the freshman, Matt Pike, the thing he likes about him is the fact he's able to hang in the pocket a little longer than Eric Hunter does. Eric got what they call those happy feet. He wants to dance around a little bit. Of course, he was more of a scrambling quarterback. We said earlier uh, he had to run for his life on many occasions last year in the run and shoot. But Mallory says Pike stays in the pocket. He's got a lot of control, a lot of discipline for a freshman. There's the numbers for Bill Mallory. After starting out the first year he was here, winless. He has built Indiana a football program. Whoa, what penetration there. Is that big Larry McDaniel? Indeed it was, number 97. He's a hoss, isn't he? Watch it right here, they Looks give like up the middle. The play. How did he get that penetration so quickly on Coleman? He ran right over Pike to get to Coleman, too. He must have been a Purdue's huddle. That sets up a third and 10 on the 30. Indiana looking for a quick three and out here on the Boilers. Pike almost fumbles the snap, recovers, passes right downfield, almost intercepted. By the linebacker, John Miller. He almost pulled that right away. And Purdue will be forced to punt. And you know what, Mike? I think the fumble return for touchdown has served as a wake-up call for Indiana's football team and its fans. Kind of shocked Indiana with that touchdown by Callaway that made it 6-0. They came back with a field goal and three and out now. And Indiana's defense is the second in the Big Ten. Offense second in the Big Ten. There's Eric Broom, tops in the Big Ten. Back to receive is Scott McGowan. Good nice punt. Kick. McGowan can't handle. He better get on that football. He does. He'll be brought down at about the seven. Scott had this problem against Ohio State. Scott had the problem against Minnesota. I asked Bill Mallory about it yesterday. He said, you know, Scott's going to be okay. He knows 
that those things happen in football and you have to recover from it, but that's a loss of at least 15 off the fumble. And of course, Indiana does have the ball, but look at the field position. The Bill Mallory Show tomorrow morning, a special edition. Starts at 11 a.m. here on TTV4. Check it out for the last time. Joe Smith and Bill Mallory. If you're an IU fan, you hope they're talking about moving on to a bowl game. That's tomorrow, 11 a.m., a special time on TTV4. I was going to say it won't be so special if they lose. That's exactly right. Indiana will start it off from the eight-yard line. Trent Green under center. Pitch back to Dunbar. He'll get a couple. James Cole, the defensive tackle with the play made by uh, Purdue there. So far, Vaughn Dunbar has been no mystery to the Purdue defense, and they're doing a pretty good job of containing him. Ran to the far side of the field, and big number 94 was there in position. You see Schwantz, 48, giving out some instructions. And if Purdue forces Indiana into this type of field position all day, they're going to stay in the football game. Just a gain of one on the play for Vaughn. Second and nine. Showing blitz, no flags. Green, a lot of pressure by Purdue there. Green was looking for Thomas Lewis. Looks like we do have a flag on the play. It's going to go against Purdue. So as I mentioned, there was some movement on the defensive line, and Purdue gets flagged for it. Offside, five yard penalty, repeat second down. The offside, look for it right here. There's number 90 moving. It's Mike Walker. And then there was that good pressure on Green, but all for not. Second and four from the 14 for Indiana. Just under two minutes here in the first quarter. Green will keep it and get up to the 16-yard line. Tackle made by Don Delvey. Okay, it's a little thing perhaps, but the penalty on Purdue, the offsides, instead of setting up a third and nine moments ago, now you've got third and short. And what it makes a difference there is if you could pin Indiana back for of the punt, you've got the ball at the midfield. Now they must stop Indiana with third and two. This is a good down to throw the football, equally good down to give the ball to Dunbar. Look at Trent's numbers rushing. Almost 200 yards. As a matter of fact, with that, probably went to about the 200 mark. Second on this Indiana team behind, of course, Vaughn Dunbar. Third and two for Indiana from the 16. Dunbar gets the first down and some more. Tank Thomas Adams with the play. the Boilers, and that's what they're looking for for Vaughn. Jim Coletto's worst nightmare is if 26 gets into the secondary. Now there he didn't have a chance to bust it, but the more times he gets a chance to meet Purdue's defensive backfield, the better chance he has of busting one. And when I talked to Jim Coletto earlier this week about Vaughn Dunbar, he said he indeed does get better as he carries the ball more. Carries it again this time up to about the 30-yard line. Ramon Batten with the tackle. Last moving first quarter with Purdue holding a 6-3 lead and Indiana has had the football for a fair amount of times and uh, starting deep in their own territory for the second time around, but able to move the ball. That's, I guess that's not a surprise when you're averaging 430 yards a game. And they'll work it. They will work it indeed. 10 seconds remain in the corner. They should get the play off. Second and six. Green to pass. Right side to the big man, number 98, Todd Walker from Springfield, Ohio. Tank Adams to make the play. He's right on the marker, too. Right on the marker. Depends on the spot as to whether it's a first down or not. And I think he's going to get it. Usually receivers and tight ends have a pretty good idea where that marker is at. That's the end of the first quarter. Purdue leads by three over the Hoosiers, but Indiana's driving.
was a first down by Coleman. Green rolling right side. Wide open Scott McGowan. And he was able to find McGowan in a host of Purdue defenders. Again, Boilermakers in zone coverage. If you can find the spot, and Green is so, so much improved over last year, was able to do just that. This is really what you call threading the needle. Now he's able to scramble, stops on the run, and look at the position right there. Four Purdue defenders, maybe five. Johnny on the spot. McGowan thinking about his Ben Davis Giants. He the junior out of Ben Davis, looking for the Oaken bucket today and looking for a state championship for his high school alma mater. Next Saturday at the Dome, of course, here on TTV. Dunbar the game. Uh -oh. Left side. Nice play by Jimmy Young. They strung that out very nicely, and Young, who's been having a terrific season, sophomore's been playing so well, was able to track him down. When Dunbar finds a part of the field he likes and doesn't have too many defenders to worry about, he is dangerous. But Young has got the speed to stay with Vaughn Dunbar. And there, as the play was being strung out, he was able to bring him down for just a gain of three. Just a sophomore out of Union, New Jersey. 5'11", 188 pound, Jimmy Young. Tied for the Big Ten lead with six interceptions. Second and seven for Trent. He'll look to pass. Right up the middle to Coleman. And he works his way down to the 26 yard line. Eric Beatty on the tackle. One of the nice things about Rod Coleman, Mike, is that he doesn't drop the football. Talking yesterday with Dave Petsky, the, the fine receivers coach of the Hoosiers, he's sure-handed. He's a possession receiver. He's big. His first touchdown catch last week against Ohio State, and when Green has the time, and that's often on straight drop back, he knows that 84 will not drop the football. He's got good size, too. 6'5", 250, the senior out of Albany, Georgia. He'd be a pretty good pick in the NFL. Maybe the best tight end in the Big Ten this year. Uh -huh. A lot of Hoosier fans think so, and he has put up the numbers to do it. At his 29th, 30th catch of the year. Easy give up the middle, gain of a couple for the Hoosiers. And he came into today, did Coleman, 28 catches, averaging about 12 plus a catch. Eric Gray on the tackle for Purdue. Looks like the Boilermakers were showing some type of blitz there as Tank Adams was trying to sneak along the far side. Of course, nothing developed and they went with the run, but Purdue, I, I have the feeling here today is doing a little more gambling, a little, little more caution to the wind type of attack. Of course, it's being the bucket game, maybe that's part of the attack, but Adams was, was sneaking around there. We may see a lot of him before long. A gain of five, though, on the play for Indiana. They'll take it second and five from the 22. Dunbar in the backfield, little trickery. Jimmy Young was there. Vaughn was looking to go to Trent Green on the near side. But Jimmy Young and Tank Adams, it looked like, were there on the coverage. You know, I talked to the Indiana coaching staff yesterday. They almost guaranteed me they wouldn't do any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> but I like it. Let's see more of it. Dunbar has thrown one pass this year, and it was nearly picked off. This is his second pass, and, uh, well, it's a... Uh, it's a duck. It could use a little work. <laughs> <laughs> Trent was in position, though, but great coverage. Great defensive play down there by Tank Adams and Jimmy Young. Third and five now for Indiana. Again from the 22. 12.48 in a second. Green back to pass. First down. McGowan gets it with the extra effort. Yep. And give McGowan uh, some credit to knowing where that yard marker was because he was positioned around the 16. His extra effort did get him down the 13, but he knew where the marker was at, and that's the mark of a good receiver. Of course, that should be required reading for a receiver. Indeed it is. Here's the play again, McGowan. Watch the stutter step, Jim. Yep. Breaks the tackle right there. That tackle made by Jimmy Young, it's not a first down. But McGowan gets the couple extra. And the Hoosiers are knocking at the door again. First and 10 on the 13. 12.30 remaining in the second quarter. Green, 100 yards passing on the day already. Eight of 12. Dunbar up the middle. Touchdown. Touchdown, Indiana. Touchdown number 11 on the year for the six foot, 207 pound senior from Fort Wayne Snyder, Vaughn Dunbar. Got a Purdue player down on the field. 
number 29, the free safety, Pat Johnson. Dunbar, 15 carries on the day now for 61 yards. Here's the score. Look at the big hole right there. 40, Scanina tried to get a mid on him, but once he was inside the five, it was touchdown, and Young was just a little too late. Pat Johnson being helped off the field. The sophomore, a good free safety. He's really been a pleasant surprise this year for Jim Coletto. Indeed. And they have a very pesky defensive backfield. Couldn't get it with the trickery, so they get the touchdown with Vaughn Dunbar. Bunnell for the kick after. It's good. And Indiana leads it 10 to 6. Their last two possessions, they've scored. Is IU on a roll? Stick around and see. Dunbar is so, so dangerous, isn't he, Jim? Yes, he is, and, and a couple of problems here. Not only an Indiana touchdown that gives the Hoosiers the lead. Nice cutback by Dunbar, but Johnson getting hurt on the play, and that will not help Purdue's secondary. But look at Vaughn. He's so strong. Fetches about 350, 400 pounds, and even if you get a leg around him, it doesn't matter, an arm around him, a mid around him, whatever around him. He's so strong that he's so difficult to bring down. The Indiana scoring drive, 12 plays, 92 yards, capped off by the 13-yard touchdown from Vaughn Dunbar. Boilermakers need to get something going here because Indiana is on a roll. Purdue to start it off with Matt Pike, of course, again, from the 20-yard line. Pitches back, handled by Hill. He's got some running room. That's a good start. And that's a good first down play up to about the 28. Tackle made by number 45, Greg Farrell. Jeff Hill was a part of this team last year in the run and shoot offense and really didn't get a, an indication at that time how good he could be because Hunter was passing a lot of times on third and long and now we're getting an indication of just how strong this young man is. You know, as a matter of fact, he played wide receiver last year. There's Von Dunbar. He's a Heisman candidate. I'll tell you what, he won't get it because of Desmond Howard. No, but he'll get a few millions. You got that right. Maybe with the Indianapolis Colts. More on that later. <laughs> Give right up the middle to Coleman, he'll get a couple. It's not like they couldn't use him. <laughs> no, you got that right. Hervin McCormick with the tackle for IU. I'll tell you what, whoever gets him is going to be able to use him. Oh, yeah. And he's being compared a lot, of course, to Anthony Thompson here a couple of years ago, who played in this football game when Purdue knocked Indiana out of the bowl game, looking for a Heisman possibility. Bill Mallory remembers that one well, probably used that one as motivation today. That was Purdue's first, first down of the afternoon. Their score, of course, coming on the Ernest Callaway play fumble kind of recovery <laughs> that's a good description uh -oh. pitch back little trickery big Nowhere. time hit in the backfield Nowhere. by Mike Middleton boy it's almost as if Indiana had practiced that play defensively because they knew where the spacing was going to be they knew what the Boilermakers were doing it's a nifty play if it works if it doesn't work here's what happens you're in a hole Middleton has just put the Boilermakers in a hole 13 on 13, Middleton and Callaway. Hill goes one way, Callaway tries to go the other, and Middleton gets a hold of Callaway. Middleton, the junior out of Cincinnati, second and 18 now for Purdue. Now, one thing the Boilermakers cannot do here is get conservative. That's a conservative call. Now, granted, they still have enough of the first down to go, and they can still pick it up, but second and long, you got to eat away at that. Two yards just doesn't get it done. Jeff Hill, six rushes, 22 yards on the day. Hill really being featured today with Corey Rogers, the second leading rusher on the team, the freshman out for today's contest. Harley Connors also spends some time in the backfield, as does the big fullback, Earl Coleman. Third and 16 from the 26 for Purdue. Pike back to pass. Good Three. rush. Callaway with room to run. Gets the this. first down and more. He may go all the way. On the chase is Middleton. Drags him out of bounds at about the 27-yard line. 
Check that closer to the 21-yard line. This is a very interesting football game because Indiana giving up the touchdown off the fumble comes back to lead 10-6. And really, this one could have gone for a big loss. Look at the pressure right there by Farrell. By 45, Greg Farrell, and then watch the cutting of one Callaway. Nice head and shoulder fake there, and he's off to the races. Summerall, Middleton in pursuit, but not before a big, big game. That gain will take him all the way to the 21-yard line. And Matt Pike has to like it. He's finally out of deep in his own end, getting to work. First and 10 from the 21, trailing by four. Handoff, big hit in the backfield, put on Earl Coleman by Troy Mason. You have to wonder what would have happened if the Boilermakers hadn't had such a bad time in Minnesota and had beaten the Gophers. They lost that game 6-3, Hunter quarterback. They'd be coming in this game 5-5 five and five, and very possibly going for a bowl game of its own. Jim Coletto said that's the game that bothers him the most this year, too. And it should. Because they indeed had a chance to win, couldn't get anything going. And they had so many opportunities. Great field position at the Metrodome and came away with a field goal. 9-10 and counting. Second and 11. Let's go. John Miller was in on top big time. Looks like he might be hurt, though. Looks like he was holding his hand. What he wound up holding was a Boilermaker jersey. Yes, he is hurt. Looks like his right wrist. Right now right he's arm. saying to himself, this is a bucket game. I can yeah. hold through. Boy, what a defensive call right there. Watch this hit he puts on Earl Coleman. Shoots in the gap, but nobody to get him. Bang. And you mentioned Ooh. shooting the gaps. That's the key to this new defense this year, changing from the 5-2 for the 4-3. Third and 16 on the 27. Pike back to pass. Time looking up the middle, just outside the outreached arms of Tedman Brown. Let's go back to what you mentioned about the switch to the 4-3. Mallory and company decided to switch in spring. The coaches said the players like this type of defense. Let's try it. Let's not use one defense for part of the year and then switch to another, kind of dally around with this, that, and the other. Let's go with one. This is a defense that allows Indiana to exploit its talents. It's an attacking defense. At times, it's a freelancing defense as the Boilermakers take a timeout. Uh, it's the type of defense that Mallory likes to play. And we'll talk more about it because it has been very, very successful. Purdue taking a timeout, trailing by four here in the Oaken Bucket game. Well, Purdue worked it up real close, Jim, on the big play to Callaway, but the Indiana defense started hammering away. So it's decision time for Purdue. It's fourth and 15. It's a long field goal. That apparently is what they're opting for, at least as they're lining up. Joe O'Leary, here's the replay of that big hit by Miller on Hill. Mm. The field goal will come from 43. From O'Leary, uh-uh, not even close. Looked like someone might have got a hand on it. If they did get a hand on it, it would have been number 31, Harry Wardlow. 
But man, oh man, you can say so much about Indiana right there, utilizing that shooting, attacking defense. And what that does is that takes their speed and quickness and makes it a weapon. Yeah. They're not that big of a defense that they can hold those blocks off for 10 yards. Instead, they shoot the gaps, they attack at all times. And I'm thinking if I'm a defensive player, that's fun. Oh, it is fun. Players love it and pick it up pretty quickly. It's like playing up-tempo basketball, yep. you know, going at it all the time. And the Hoosiers will go on the offensive. They have scored on their last two possessions. A 92-yard drive last time, Number capped off by that Dunbar. touchdown run from Vaughn Dunbar. There, Dunbar with the carry, tackled by Don Delvey. You know, considering their field position in this game, like this is uh, this is terrific for them. They started one drive or one situation where they had the ball at the one and the scoring drive at the eight. And now they start uh, past the 25. That's Dunbar, all right. 16 rushes, 68 yards, one touchdown. Second and eight for IU. Green looking to pass. Just out of the hands. Not a penalty flag out there thrown late. Looked like it was Thomas Lewis on there. We'll it's see what that's pass. all about. Green's pass intended for Thomas Lewis, number eight. We do have a penalty flag. And it'll go against the Hoosiers. Again, Indiana, the most penalized football team in the Big Ten. Defensive pass interference. Or offensive pass interference. On the offense. Lost I just had to think about that one for a second. <laughs> offensive pass interference called against IU. Actually, Indiana liked the call the first time. They would have preferred that. You know, you talk about what Bill Mallory has done with this offense. They have an opportunity this year, averaging 429 yards per game. They need 287 yards to surpass the 1979 record of 4,580 yards on a season. This could be the most productive offense in Indiana history. That was a fun football team because I believe that's the year they went to the Holiday Bowl and had that wild game with BYU, beat them 38-37. Tim Wilburn company, they scored a lot of points that season. Undefeated here at the house. Of course, all the losses, tough losses for Indiana, Iowa, Ohio State, Notre Dame, and Michigan, all on the road. They knew the schedule was going to be tough. Record-wise, you say, well, they still didn't beat anybody this year. But indeed, they are looking for a bowl opportunity. Green looking for an opportunity to complete a pass. He does right up the middle to Eddie Beating. A couple of yards short of the first down, I believe. Tank Adams on the play. Of course, Indiana fans want him to go for it, but the ball is only at the IU 35, and that would be crazy. And Bill Mallory agrees with you. And he's not crazy. Because they're going in a punt formation here. Love meeting with him in his office yesterday. He's got a big sign there, Mike, that says, when you come in here, lock your jaw. <laughs> Jim DiGiulio, the freshman, first punt of the day, was 22 yards. Look at the bounce. This one bounces nicely <laughs> inside the 20-yard line. Hey, and that's effective, too. Bounced well, and it stayed away from Ernest Callaway. Indiana still leads by four. 6.50 remaining in the first. It's the battle for the old oak and bucket here on TTV4. Here we are back. Purdue to take the ball on the 17-yard line. First and ten. Trailing by four. Hand off to Hill. Flag on the play. That usually indicates a hold when it's thrown from that position. Usually. Nine times out of ten. Let's see if it's one of those times. Yep. Of course, I was going to refer to the exception to the rule if it wasn't. Cover myself both ways. Here, you Michael. had an A and B, right? <laughs> yes. Those are from your days at Purdue. <laughs> Actually, I learned that in broadcasting early in my career. <laughs> And then used it often, yes. needless to say. Rule one, if rule one doesn't work, refer to rule two. Thomas and Beatty. Thomas and Beatty again. 26 and 27, you've got to block first and quarter that. All right, see, the safety hand came down. That's why I got an eight. He came down. That's fine. You just keep me blocked first and quarter on the other side. That's the distance to the goal line. Repeat first down. Repeat first down. There's the call on the hold. That'll march Purdue back to the nine yard line. They'll go first and 18. Interesting to hear the conversation from the Indiana sidelines there. 
Little cool, little earmuffs out today. That's yeah, football weather, though. But the house is certainly rocking here with Indiana and Purdue well, fans. Tonight, Coming down 37 this morning, hit a little bit north of Martinsville, and things started <laughs> to slow on down. There's big Bobby Dressel. There's your penalties. Indiana with five, Purdue two for 13 yards. Pike the give to Coleman. He'll get up to about the 15. I wouldn't be surprised if we see the screen again. That worked so well the last time out. And Indiana, like Purdue, is, has had problems with the screen from time to time. Of course, when you drop your, your secondary coverage back and if you have your linebackers playing back, you are susceptible to a screen. 230 yards rushing on the year coming into today for Earl Coleman. That equals the team high with Corey Rogers. Strongest running back on the team is Coleman with a squat of over 500 pounds. 546. I could do that. You and me both, maybe. <laughs> Pike back to pass. Looks like his tight end tripped up a little bit. Number 87, Scott Green. Yeah, his pass was going one way and Green was going the other. They're watching in San Antonio, Texas today. John Wempler, a big Indiana fan. And you mentioned last year they were watching in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Maui Classic. Start time, uh, oh gosh, 100 in the morning. That's about right, <laughs> which they're doing on the West Coast today. A lot of Southern California, Indiana, and Purdue alums. And in fact, uh, with Indiana shooting for the Copper Bowl, big alumni base in Tucson and Phoenix. One for three play. on third down conversions. This is a long one, third and 12 for the Boilers. Let's. Farrell fought off. There's going to be a call in the backfield, possibly. Pike still running for his life hit. and hit hard. What a hit. Hit hard by John Miller again. Miller's laying down some shoulders, isn't he? Yes, and I, I, we won't know exactly until we hear the postgame comments, but these guys, a lot of these guys were here. It's going to be against Purdue. A lot of these players were here two years ago when Purdue beat Indiana for the bucket and taunted Indiana afterwards. And that has not been forgotten. No bowl, no bucket, no Heisman, I think, uh -huh. were the three words or the three phrases that were called. Holding on the offense, decline. It was the holding because of the great penetration from Greg Farrell. Look at Farrell, so strong. They just can't contain 45. And while Pike is able to elude him momentarily, it only sets up inevitably what will happen, and that is good coverage defensively. He's got to run for his life and eventually drop for a loss. So back to receive Scott McGowan. Indiana declining the penalty, obviously, taking the fourth down play, punting from his end zone. McGowan gets it at the 47. Into Purdue territory, brought down at the 45. Play made by Matt Kingsbury for the Boilermakers on special teams coverage. This is an important series right here defensively for Purdue. Boilermakers can hold Indiana to a field goal or less. Still very much in the game. But a touchdown sends Indiana, for all practical purposes, to the locker room with a 17-6 lead. And now you're kind of flirting with a blowout. The season premiere of the Bob Knight Show tomorrow here on TTV4 at 11.30 a.m. immediately following the 11 o'clock broadcast of the Bill Mallory Show. We are here at Memorial Stadium, 10-6 Indiana, 5-10 remaining in the half. Green nice being move. chased, goes left side, dumps off. He's gaining just a couple fighting till yeah. the end. Jim Schwantz makes play on big number 84, Rod Coleman. Nice spin move by Green there to get loose. Uh, again, considered to be the most improved player in the Big Ten very, very well because I think of things like this. You know, he's got the sense to know that he's in trouble. And Jimmy Young on the blitz from the safety position. And able to spin around and prevent that from being a long loss into a five-yard game. And a good fight at the end of that play by Rod Coleman, the big tight end. He's big, all right. To get to second and five from the 40. Up the middle goes Dunbar. Now he'll cut back left. And he'll be close to a first down. Brought down on the play by Tank Adams. This will be one of these times where 
we won't say something great about Von Donner. <laughs> because there's so much to say. <laughs> you know, we were talking earlier before, though, about Von, the comparisons to Anthony Thompson. One thing Coletto said to me earlier in the week, that Von's more dangerous. He's he's more to kind of go, all right, I'm going to improvise out there. Yep. Where Anthony was just so strong, he'd just bowl you right over. And the turf helps because it gives you that extra spring. Coletto said that would be a definite advantage for the Hoosiers on this day. The turf has seemed to stay pretty dry so far. Green back to pass. Looking left side, Lewis. Great catch, touchdown, Indiana. What do we say before? The big play threat and the great speed. Green had the time, got that single coverage again. Now the Boilermakers play a lot of zone, but Mallory had told me that if they could get that solo coverage, they're obviously going to be more dangerous. They've got the burners, they've got the good receivers, they got the touchdown. Number six on the year for number eight, Thomas Lewis. A 35-yard touchdown reception for the sophomore out of Akron. They're going to love to have him back. But now looking to make it an 11-point lead. And he does. This is what Jim Coletta was worried about. Indiana getting on an offensive roll. They have now scored on three straight possessions. I, I mentioned earlier that this was an important defensive series for Purdue, not to give up the big play, not to give up the touchdown. And that is exactly, unfortunately for the Boilermakers, what happened. He had Coleman in range, but he knew exactly who he was throwing to. One-on-one -on -one coverage there. Just a great placement of the ball again. And if you could get that single coverage in any secondary, Mike, with a good receiver and a fine quarterback, more often than not, you'll complete the play. Yeah, Jimmy Young was back there, but Lewis waited till the last second, spun away from the defender, and indeed a great play. Trent Green ups his numbers to 161 yards on 11 of 16 on the day. Couple of big ones going to that man right there. Couple other ones going to number four. Green still has another season, so Indiana enjoying an 11-point lead here will enjoy his services next year. There will be no Vaughn Dunbar. They lose a couple of key defensive people, but they'll be okay. Yeah, indeed they will. Indiana 17-6 lead, 3:59 remaining in the half. Purdue really needs to get something going on this offensive drive. Yes, we mentioned the last drive being important. This one maybe even more critical. Got to get some points on the board. Again, Callaway and Coleman deep. But now to kick off for Indiana. Callaway takes it on the two. And he'll be brought down about the 23. Flag on the play. Couple of them might have caught a face mask there on the far side. Sure appears to be that way. Matt Hansen with the play. You could, you could see on that side right there, as we'll try to tell from the replay, Callaway's head just come up a little bit, Jim. 23 may be the man that gets, yep, there it is. That's Steve Perkins. And they may march off 15. This may ask on the defense. A five yard, so an unintentional face mask Purdue penalty called then. Purdue could use 15. Indeed. They've got plenty of time here, though, to try to establish a drive. 3.53 remaining in the half. It's important at the very least, Mike, to keep the football. You don't want to go three and out if you throw the ball or whatever you decide to do because Indiana, with this high-octane offense, come back and score again. And up by 11, they can throw caution to the win. Yep. They can let them all fly. Yep. And they've got a group of receivers that can indeed. Blitz. Pike. He looking. picked it up. Very nicely picked up. Goes to the big tight end on the far side. Number 87, Scott Green. Play made by John Miller as he pushes Green out of bounds. You know, that's one area that Jim Coletto is looking for improvement next year is the tight end position with Grigson back there at tight end. And Scott Green, he's got a couple of freshmen who he said are just a little bit too small, just not physically there yet. They will be, but they're looking at two freshmen there. Where on the other side of the ball, Coleman, a big senior, big and burly at 250 pounds for IU. That's also a big thing for the offensive line. Mm -hmm. Have the tight end in there blocking. First and 10 from the 39. Pike to the near side. To Tony Simmons, another freshman tight end. 
play made by Jim Summerall for the Hoosiers. Matt Pike has done a great job, and Coletto have done a great job, and staff of mixing the plays up here, looking to side left, now throwing to side right. This drive started around the 20-yard line or so. Now it's all the way up to midfield, and only elapsed about 20 seconds off the clock, so the Boilermaker is doing a good job of getting that offense rolling for the first time today. An 11-yard gain on that play. Takes it to the midfield strike. First and 10 for Purdue. Two plays, two first downs. Looking to get this game close before it goes to halftime. Pike to Coleman. He'll get a couple. Number 34, Earl Coleman. The tackle made by number 95, Charles Bochamp. Charles Bochamp with the tackle. Boilermakers have two timeouts left in the first half. They've already burned one of them. Keep that in mind as we get down to three minutes. Bill Mallory all week long said, hey, this is a bucket game. Throw everything out the window, which is a little bit different than Jim Coletto's approach. He said, it's a bucket game, and he's a man who knows rivals. Oh, yeah. Big time. USC, UCLA, Arizona State, Arizona, Michigan, Ohio State, his coaching and playing days. But he said, once we get to this right here on the 100-yard stripes, it's a football game. Pike scrambling. To Callaway, he cannot hold on. Pike is so elusive in that backfield. The, the more I see him, the more I like him. And it's amazing that this kid has not played very much this year to be so poised because there was a, a potential sack right there, and he is able to find his way and be evasive as IU puts the blitz on. Just kind of eludes one tackler, steps up. Now looks as if he's going to run. He's got a receiver. And uh, was an unable to complete the pass, but more importantly, avoided the long sack. Coleman did a nice job, too, of riding Bochamp out there for yeah. the fullback position. But that brings up a third and eight from the 48. An important play here for Purdue. Jim Coletto says, come on, guys, let's get it going right now. He is indeed a competitive man. He's going to take a little time to think about it, as is Matt Pike. You know, Coletto said... Earlier in the week, Tuesday's press conference I attended up in Lafayette, he said, Matt Pike earned the right to start this football game today. Take nothing away from Eric Hunter. Yes, indeed, we now do have a quarterback controversy, but Hunter was really told when he came in this fall, change everything. He was really able to improvise a year ago in the run and shoot under Fred Akers. Coletto's really playing a pro-style offense where he has to perform on seven-yard routes and not really improvise in the backfield. It's been difficult for Eric to take away, but don't think for one second that that means that Pike's the man next year. What Coletto said is they'll fight for it again in the fall, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens tomorrow. It all starts on Indiana Sports Tonight. Myself and Ted Kitchell come our way at 1.30. We'll have some great features for you. And then Indiana and the Soviet Nationals. Bob Knight and the Hoosiers looking to rebound in an exhibition game from that loss to UCLA. Starts at 1.30 tomorrow, live here on TTV4 from Assembly Hall. This is what they're fighting for today. You ever get a day off around here, Mike? Uh, not lately, I'll tell you what. Wow. Not lately, but that's all right. This is how I like it, getting into basketball season. This is a lot of fun. It is fun. Doing the weekly show has been, has been a great joy for me, and hopefully some of our viewers have had a chance to watch it. Watch this play right here. Pike gets away from a couple of tackles. Fumble on the play. Indiana football. We were talking about how loose Pike has been. He was able to get away from one defender, but this time everything collapsed. This time Purdue did not provide the protection and the Hoosiers come up with the ball in great field position at 225 with which to work. Summerall coming up with the ball. Reason for IU fans to get on their feet. Pike, as you said, did do a good job getting away from the rush at first. Yes, but the protection breaks down right here. While he's able to avoid one, he can't avoid another. Farrell forcing the fumble. In perfect position to recover the ball, and now the danger of a blowout. Boilermakers have to hold Indiana to a field goal. Indiana, five possessions, two touchdowns, one field goal, two punts. Both of those punts coming early. Green goes right to the air. Dump off to Dunbar. Good call. He's got some blockers. He'll cut back a little bit, improvise. Slips on the turf at about the 41-yard line. Slipped right in front of Jimmy Young. That's a good call because they had the Hoosier spread offense out there to three receivers. Gives the defense with two minutes left to play the indication where we're going to go long. But they set up that screen. Didn't develop as well as they would have liked to have. But again, if it had developed 15, 20-yard gain, you're right there knocking on the door again. 
a four-yard gain it turns into for Vaughn Dunbar. Second and six for IU, 148 and counting. Trent fakes the give, now passes downfield, intercepted by in number 55, Eric Beattie. That an important play right there for the Boilers. Very important. Wasn't a very particularly good thrown pass, and Beattie right in position. And this may have turned around the Boilermakers' fortunes because a touchdown by Indiana locks this one up potentially, and Beattie goes up, makes the two-handed grab, and returns the football past the 30 up to the 33, and that keeps the Hoosiers off the scoreboard and, more importantly, gives Purdue another crack at it. Not many mistakes on the part of the junior quarterback today, but that was one of them. Clearly a bad throw ball. Yeah, Beatty jumped right in there nicely. And that's that stingy defense yep. of Purdue. Now keep in mind, Boilermakers have only one timeout with which to work with. One forty remaining. They pick up the ball at the 33. Pike to Callaway, just over his outreached hands. Good pressure on the play from Mose Richardson. One thing that does, though, the incomplete pass stops the clock at 136. Still have enough time to get in position for a field goal or march down for a touchdown. They're just going to have to do a little quicker. Field goal would put them down by eight. That missed extra point. We'll see if Purdue gets back into the football game. Could be costly later on. Pitch back. And tackle made in the backfield. Mike, I don't understand that call. Try not to be critical too many times, but I don't understand the, the merits of that call when you have only one timeout left and you need to get a score. And now a timeout is, this may be an official or an injury timeout, but you have to move the football here. And on a second down and a minute 20 with which, with, uh, which to work with, what are you running the ball for? Larry McDaniel, the junior from St. Louis, credited with the tackle in the backfield on that play. And he got in there in a hurry. Indiana's defense, as we mentioned, second in the Big Ten, allowing just 290 yards on the game. Pike, 73 yards on 3 of 11. He'll need to get at least 11 for the first down here. Pike, well short of the first down. Nice catch, but it didn't amount to anything, and wisely, Indiana now calls timeout. Jim Summerall on the good coverage of Earl Coleman. And Coleman, really, with the way that pass was thrown low, wasn't going anywhere anyway. And let's go back to something you mentioned earlier. If Indiana gets the ball back and precious little time left about winging it, you know, they've right. got the receivers, they've got the burners, and they'll probably get the ball around their own 25 or 30, depending on how the type of kick that Eric's able to get off. But good position coming up anyway for Indiana. They've stopped Purdue and hold a 17-6 lead. And at the least, it's a 17-6 lead, unless we have something really big happen here in the last 50 seconds. And I'm sure Bill Mallory likes the idea of going into the locker room like that. And really, it, Indiana's defense has not allowed anything to happen today. The touchdown scored on a very flukish type of play that is not the fault of the defense, um, although it is recorded against the defense. Certainly. But I use defense has played very well, and that's why it owns an 11-point lead. Number 15, back in formation. And their offense has really, after the slow start, done exactly what they've wanted to do. They're going to send everybody here, it appears. McGowan, lonely, lonely, lonely. Nope, back dropping there. back. Uh -oh. Fumble the snap by uh -oh. Bruin. He just kicks it off the ground. There's Nobody from Indiana is going to touch it. flags on the play. He drop kicked that one, did Eric Bruin, <laughs> off the ground. Well, we have seen about everything here today, haven't we? Something about the aura of the bucket. Yep. I guess the first question is, can you do that? I don't think so. Because <laughs> it's going to be deep in Purdue territory. An illegal kick. In fact, the head referee was kind of smiling when he said, you know, I, I've seen everything, folks, but that you can't do. It isn't often the ref gets to do the kick thing, is it? No, no. And Bruins kind of looking at his hands now. He's, he's just saying the ball was slippery, it looks like. Now, I did see that in the movie, The Longest Yard, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't relate to college football, I don't think. <laughs> Burt Reynolds. 
That was a heck of a touchdown to win it, though, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Longest one-yard run in history. Here's the <laughs> official call. Illegally kicking a loose ball. Lost it down. That's the offense. Yep, kicking a loose ball. The ball had hit the ground before Broon kicked it away. And now look at the field position for Indiana as they mark this off all the way down to the 13. When they talk about plays, they'll talk about that one. Purdue's got to get a good stick here because a touchdown puts Indiana well, well comfortably ahead and probably will sew it up. 17-6 with 38 seconds to go. And importantly, two timeouts for Indiana. So if they want to pound it up with the run a couple of times, they have the timeouts to allow them to do so. Could see that. Could see a screen. Maybe a play action on first down. Might see the ball go to number 26. Yep. Green's going to keep it. Dumping it off. Incomplete. And Green had plenty of time back there. He could have run the football if he wanted to. He was looking for Todd Walker, the fullback sometime who plays tight end. This really is a game of numbers as you take a look at Eric. All by himself, and that's, that's the way this game is for kickers when things don't go well. If you don't believe that, how the kickers stay by themselves and kind of stay focused throughout the game, go to Colts game and watch Stark and Biasucci. They are in a world of their own, trying to concentrate on how they can be effective in the game. Green looking to be effective. Looking and finding a touchdown for Indiana. Wait a second, are they gonna say he went out of bounds? I think they are. I think they're gonna say Eddie Thomas stepped out, but I'm not sure. Let's watch the replay right here, Jim, and see. Catches the football around the five. Does he stay in? Yep. Yes, he does. Touchdown. And they're setting up for the point after. Indiana is rolling it up big time here in the Oak and Bucket game. A nice job. Nice job staying in bounds by Eddie Thomas, the senior from Fort Knox, Kentucky, the flanker. Boys, it's cold. T. Bunnell just kicks it with no return. A wise decision there. For those of you enjoying our game on the TTV4 delayed telecast, we might know the outcome of that Purdue game by now. I saw Purdue against Ball State in its NIT Open. The Boilermakers don't have a bad basketball team. Playing very good defense, held off Chandler Thompson in that game. Of course, I can't wait for next season to see Robbie play. I think the whole Big Ten will be thrilled to watch him, except maybe who has to defend him. Yeah, the whole Big Ten, uh, minus the nine teams that have to play <laughs> against him. Glenn Robinson is a monster. It'll be interesting to see how Quanzo Martin comes in. It really, Purdue had a nice recruiting class, and when you add Robinson next year, you're right. They lose Craig Riley this year. Other than that, they really don't lose a lot. Woody nope. they're going to miss, but other than that, they come back with the same team. But now we're talking football. We're talking 26 seconds left in Indiana with a big lead at 24-6. Give to Jeff Hill. He'll get up past the 40-yard line. Jim Summerall with the tackle for the Hoosiers. The tackle made by number 29, Paul Williams, and number 47, Mark Hagan. Nine seconds and counting. That should be the last play of the half here. Will they get it off? No, they won't. Indiana with a big lead at halftime, hoping to go bowling with a victory today at Memorial Stadium. 24-6, your score at the halfway point.
interesting to have been in the locker room of Indiana's at halftime to see what Mallory's speech would have been because you want to keep up your intensity. They are two quarters away from a trip to the Copper Bowl in Tucson, Arizona on New Year's Eve. And yet with a 24-6 lead, sometimes things can slip a little bit. Your intensity can get away from you. So knowing Coach Mal, I'm sure he had a few things to say and try to treat this as if the game is 0-0, which isn't easy to do, but you want to keep things going as well as you had them in the first. Might have been easy to remind them by saying two years ago, 15-14. That is a big reminder. Yes. Right now it is 24-6, though. Just starting the second half, Mike Goldberg, Jim Barber, your way. The annual Oaken Bucket game, Trent Green, an annual trip to the outside, as he will do oftentimes, but doesn't gain too much there. Jimmy Schwantz on the tackle for the Boilermakers. Nice fake by Green, but uh, nobody was fooled by it. Now he gets a little attention to his equipment, and the Boilermakers able to stop the very first play from scrimmage here in the second half, which they will have to do a lot of because they're down three touchdowns. You know, you talk about bowl games. What a difference the Peach Bowl made last year in the mental attitude of one Trent Green. He knew he was going to be the starter coming in this year, but I don't know if everybody was so sure he would be nearly as effective as he has been. As you mentioned earlier, Jim, quite possibly the Big Ten Player of the Year as far as improvement, comeback player of the year. That comeback right over the middle and incomplete. Trent has worked a lot during the offseason on his game. He's a smarter quarterback. He has a little bit more uh, discipline out there, not to imply that he's a freelance type of guy, but he understands when that pocket is starting to collapse what he must do. He understands he has to step up in the pocket occasionally or he has to keep the football. He's really having a fine season. Discipline and, of course, confidence, which is so important for a quarterback. 12 of 20, 165 yards, two touchdowns on the day for Trent Green. Hoosiers looking at a third and 11 from the 36. Green back to pass. And getting the first down just outside of it, Eddie Thomas. Thomas forced out of bounds by Eric Beatty. Thomas does a nice job of finding the sidelines, and of course he heads right toward the marker. This is just a straight drop back. Green has the time, nothing fancy, right out of the backfield practically. Actually more along the side out in the flat, but Thomas had the open territory, and he saw the yard marker and knew what he had to get. McGowan was going deep on the route, allowed Eddie to cut right through. He's having a good day with one touchdown, four receptions, 58 yards. Vaughn caught in the backfield by a big, big boiler and number 39, Trent Decatur. Decatur 6'2", 235, senior out of Carmel. His last game in the Golden Black today. Now Indiana is in a position that Purdue, we mentioned, could have been in the first half, and that is ball control. Eat up the clock, okay. use some time, get at least some points off the possession, three or six, and salt this one away if they can. Second and 10, no gain on that play. Dunbar, the lone setback. Green looking to pass. Going right over the middle. Still in the air. And intercepted by the Boilers. That's Jeff Scanina with the football. And he holds on. Indiana, Wisconsin don't play soccer till tomorrow. But that was indeed a head ball, wasn't it? Looks like the first plays of each of these two halves in this football game have uh, come from the bazaar. Green gets credited for the interception, but give the assist two helmets. Point. One, two. <laughs> Off of Brian Thurman and Rod Coleman, and then Scanina <laughs> picks it up. I got to tell you, Mike, they practice this all the time. Absolutely. Jerry Yagley, if he was watching that, liked what he saw. So Purdue gets what they need quick, a break, and they'll try to get it going offensively. The Indiana defense will try to hold Purdue to start from the 47-yard line. Jeff Hill. Stopped at about the midfield point. The running game is having problems now against Indiana's front four. And probably will have to start improvising a little bit more with the offense to get something going. 18-point deficit, not impossible. Plenty of time in order to do it. What did we talk about at halftime at quarterback for the Boilermakers, number nine? Eric Hunter. So Pike is gone, and Hunter, the guy that can get him back there in a hurry. Is now calling the signals. Second and eight. The pitch to Hill. Gets near a first down. 
What makes Eric Hunter so effective, and you're looking at Jeff Hill there off the option, but what makes Hunter so effective is his ability to scramble, his ability to find the deep receiver who use Hill as a receiver on occasion. And even though Mallory's team is up 18 points, this is perhaps the most dangerous quarterback in college football when he can get things going. Jeff Hill, 11 rushes, 33 yards on the day. Pike is out, Hunter is in. There he is, improvising, rolling left. Looking for yardage, forced out of bounds. He's so elusive. He's the type of guy that you should be able to bring down upon first looking at him, but he scrambles so well. The penalty, by the way, is against Purdue. He scrambles so well that he's able to do things. Now, this is not a great season for Eric Hunter. The numbers indicate that. Of course, these are running numbers, but he's not having the type of year he wants. And even in throwing the football, look at that, touchdowns and interceptions, that's not a good Eric Hunter season. But it's a new offensive formation you talked about. It's going to take time. And let's face it, if the guy is a top draft pick, uh, a first-round draft pick like a lot of people thought originally, he's got to learn this type of formation. Penalty will go against Purdue on the play. Hunter's first football game, if I recall, his team down 28-0 to Michigan State. He brings the Boilers back within 28-21 and nearly won the game at the end. In fact, the locker room, it was a strange situation. They lost the football game, and everybody was excited and happy because they knew they had themselves a marquee player in Hunter. Jim Coletto still does believe in his athletic ability, but he said you need more than athletic ability to be a quarterback. You sure do. He likes Eric Hunter, but he said, hey, the offense is staying. Eric Hunter will have to change. This is a good move on the part of Coletto. This is the man that can catch things up quick for Purdue. Purdue starts first and 23 from the 47. Hunter back to pass to Callaway, just short of the first down by a couple. That's a good play on first and 23 indeed, Jim. Tackle made by Mose Richardson for the Hoosiers. Hunter has such a quick release, not only being elusive in the backfield and can scramble, but after the short fake, just a bullet right there. It's funny to see Hagen ran that man over in the backfield, but still Jeff Hill made the block so Hunter could get the pass away. No lead is safe with Hunter out there. Keep that in mind. It's a little bit safer with that man on the sidelines, but look for him to be back in in a second. Second and three from the 32 of Indiana for Purdue. They trail by a bundle. The give to Hill. He's got the first down and more. Left sideline, 20-yard line. He'll be forced out of bounds inside the 10. Finally forced out on the play by Damon Watts. Credit Jim Coletto with Purdue's offensive movement here in the second half because he has decided to change quarterbacks. Knowing that full well his team's down 18 points, he's going with the high, the high octane quarterback, the guy who can get them back in the game. The good passing game opens up the running game. Look at the hole for Hill right here. And as they start to spread the field with Eric Hunter, you may see more of this. And Purdue, touchdown at this particular point, they're within a couple of possessions of getting even. And on the left side there, too, in the corner of your screen, you saw a good block by Tedman Brown, the wide receiver. Inside the 10, first and goal from the 6 for Purdue. Hunter, as we mentioned, a quarterback. Gives to the big fullback, and he'll get just a couple of any. That was Houston Malden, the freshman. Mark Hagan with the tackle. So many underclassmen on this football team. Right? Eric Hunter, one of them, only a junior. Remember, the Big Ten freshman of the year. Led the Big Ten in total offense a year ago. Under the run and shoot of Fred Akers. It will be interesting. It'll be interesting to see next fall, too. I mean, just looking ahead a little bit, this Pike-Hunter battle. But hey, take two good quarterbacks anytime you can, especially in the Big Ten, as physical of a conference as it is. No gain on the last play. Still second on the six now. Let's, they pick it up. Hunter rolling right. Doesn't have anybody except four Hoosiers chasing him. He's knocked down a bounce at about the four. Boilermakers did a good job of picking up the blitz. And Hunter, again, being as elusive as he is, was able to scramble to the far side and get out of bounds. Damon Watts and Matt Bamba on the chase of Eric Hunter. You know, this is important for Eric Hunter. He can make a statement to the Purdue coaching staff because their memories will be based on what they see in the final regular season game or the final season game of this year. And if he performs well, that's something they can hold on to. A la the Peach Bowl a year ago with Trent Green. Yes. The last film you look at is Purdue, Indiana. If they see Hunter doing well, very good chance he could be the man next year again. Just over 10 minutes remaining. 
Here in the third quarter, Purdue must get seven right here. Third and four from the four. Hunter keeps the ball. Looking incomplete. Great pressure by Indiana. They did that attacking defense early, didn't they, Jim? Yes. Excuse me, Mike. That's what made that happen there because it forced Hunter to throw quickly. Boilermakers are going to opt for three, and I think that's a, that's a good decision here because it puts them on the number to be down two possessions or two scores with the two-point conversion. On a third and goal play like that, in the game, 24-6, to six, they got to get that seven. I agree. But yet they're going to settle for three here, not gambles because still a lot of time left. O'Leary to attempt the field goal attempt. Little short number. Is up and good. So the half starts off well for Purdue. They get a turnover and three points. They pulled it within 24 to 9, 10 15 remaining in the third quarter. Needed seven there, but hey, I mean, well, there still is a lot of time left, though. But you got to figure that IU is going to hold on to the football and knock off a lot of clock. Right, but on fourth and four, you don't go though either. I mean, no way, no way. Right, right. Six the rest of the way. Well, 24-9 is 15 points. Purdue on a field goal by Joe O'Leary has pulled to within 15. He kicks off, finally deep. Vaughn Dunbar can't hold on, the ball rolls through the end zone. Indiana will start on the 20 yard line. That's the first time they've kicked back there. Yeah, let's go back to the field goal as to whether the Boilermakers should have gone for it or not. Uh, pro and cons of it. If you go for it, you get six. Yes, you are making it a football game. Three keeps you still back two touchdowns at 15. I thought the field goal was important, and I thought the decision was okay to do that just to get some confidence out of getting some points from the drive. And you think about the two-point conversion, of course, in college football. Sure. They just need to score twice now, one of them being a two-point conversion. They can get 15 points and tie up this football game. Indiana does not want that to happen. One way to try to prevent it is give the ball to Vaughn Dunbar. He gets just a couple there, up to the 22. Tackle made by number 94, James Cole. Dunbar tries to run left, and the first down running play stopped rather nicely for a short gain. Well, the Makers have really defensed Dunbar rather well so far today. He's got some respectable numbers, but nothing... Nothing catastrophic, nothing that you would say he's taken over the game. 74 yards on 19 carries and a touchdown. That a 13-yard run by Vaughn. He'll get the ball again. Now actually play action by Trent. Completes it to the big tight end. Eric Beattie with the tackle. Trent faked me out. That's faked okay. out a few Boilermakers, too. He is very, very, very elusive on that play. And really, that's one of the areas that he has improved on. As you look at Coleman, 84, he has been able to hide the football much better be a more deceptive quarterback. This is something that Jeff George, I thought, in his final season in Illinois and in the Peach Bowl a couple years ago, was so good at. And if you're going to plan on life after college football, namely in the NFL, this is one of the uh, this is one of the assets. Rod Coleman with the reception. They'll mark it just shy of the first down marker, third and one for IU. Green pushes ahead, and he gets the first down. Got a nice surge there, and that's a safe call and an effective one. And an effective call last time, too, with Trent rolling out. Spread out the defense. I'd say there were four boilers who went after Vaughn Dunbar. Rod Coleman, of course, the big tight end. He can really catch about any ball you put within a five-yard radius of him. Indeed. They're watching, by the way, at Knicks here in Bloomington. Carry and company getting so far an opportunity to join the Hoosiers' 15-point lead. First and ten for IU. Dunbar in the backfield uh -oh. alone. A lot of movement. Uh-oh. They're never even going to get that one off. James Cole jump for Purdue. 
ball start, simulating the start to play by the quarterback. But the call's going to go against IU. Looks like that's the quarterback and center not on the same page. Green step back there. And against Indiana. Of course, the defense can move around. They can cross over, come back, and what happened there is Green just kind of pulled out a little early. And usually when they blow it down that quickly, it's an offensive penalty as opposed to a defensive offside. So first and 15 now. Vaughn keeps the ball that time. Jeff Scanina with the tackle. Nice play by big number 40. He still has another season. And again, they've got Vaughn Dunbar's number here to start the second half. Dunbar not able to get in that secondary, not create opportunities for Indiana. The spread offense on part of the Hoosiers, three receivers will open things up a little bit for Dunbar. Second and 14. Eight minutes left in the third quarter of the football game. IU up by 15. Green back to pass. Right over the middle to wide open Coleman, and he gets the first down. Brought down by Raman Benton. Mike, that's the Hoosiers spread offense. Three receivers, two to the far side, one to the near. Not only do you have the benefits of picking up the first down, but this will start to open things up a little bit for Dunbar. Look at the time Green has. Just a straight shot practically to his right. And the big fella doesn't drop very many. Similar to a big gainer they had earlier, that same play with Rod in the middle. He's putting his stamp on an all Big Ten season today, isn't he? He's a good looking prospect for the National Football League draft. 6'5, 250 out of Albany, Georgia. I often wonder why teams don't throw to their tight ends more. So do a lot of the tight ends. <laughs> good yeah. day today. Four receptions, 48 yards. That's 12 yards a catch. So do a lot of the tight ends, yeah, don't they? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They spent a lot of time blocking and not a lot of time catching. Pat Beach going, I can catch, I can catch. Yeah. <laughs> Give me the ball. First and 10 from the 43. Give to Dunbar, left side. He's got some open space. One man to beat, he does so. He's being chased down finally. Brought down at about the 12 yard line by Tank Adams. He had one man in Jimmy Young to beat, did so, and then Adams cut him off on the nice angle. And but a again, big run. And again with that Hoosier spread offense, three receivers moments ago, the pass to Coleman, the first down, it starts to open up the field a little more. And you'll see Dunbar getting the opportunity to run. Gets past the initial down lineman, gets the second step, and able to get a big gain on it. Credit IU's offensive attack back at the 30, where they threw the football with the three receivers. And a big block by Eddie Beatty there, about 10 yards downfield, that really sprung Vaughn loose. Vaughn Dunbar now over, now over 100 yards on the day with that big long gainer. 21 rushes, 120 yards. IU first and 10 from the 12. Looking to add to the 15-point lead. Dunbar. Inside the 10, inside the 5. Fumble on the play, it looks like. And I think it might be Purdue football. Eric Gray comes up with it, along with Jeff Scanina. Looks like Gray forced the fumble. Scanina with the recovery. That's an important break because Indiana's marching for a touchdown that would up the lead to 31-9. Let's see how it happened. Because Dunbar was able to cut back. Still has, he's kind of carrying it real loosely. Almost hit his own man there. And the ball was loose at that point. Looked as if he bumped into uh, number four, Beatty. That might have been what lodged it loose. And then he got a big hit from the backside from Gray. And then it looks like Scanina came up with the ball. IU's been hampered with turnovers all year. That's the third one on the afternoon. Purdue has turned it over twice. Eric Hunter and the Boilermakers will start it off on their four-yard line. With a big safe play coming right up the middle. Big Arlie Connors. Arlie a sophomore out of St. Louis, Missouri. Six foot, 209 pounds, averaging five yards a carry, rushed for 311 yards. One thing that Purdue does have is a lot of different guys, not a Vaughn Dunbar in the backfield, but a lot of different guys that have contributed, many of them young. Hill the tailback, a sophomore. 
Connors a sophomore. Corey Rogers a sophomore. Or Corey Rogers the freshman out today. Second and eight. Hunter looking to pass to the big tight end. Just short of the first down. Mose Richardson, nice play. Looks like they'll mark him just a yard short. They'll set up a third and one, but Hunter able to find this, the short route, the safe route to get him out of, uh, at least for the moment, some very dangerous territory because if he gets sacked back here, it's two points, and Indiana gets the ball back. Simmons, the freshman, a nice job of hauling it in and then working up forward to it. And just about a yard shy of the first down. They'll mark it third and one on the 14. Oilers need to get out of this hole right here. It'd be great for IU to stop defensively. That should be plenty for the first down. The big man, Arlie Connor, is brought down by Mark Hagan. With that full house backfield, they've got all type of options, and namely what they want to do at that point is just get one yard. We've seen them use it against Iowa this year and effectively against Michigan State, and it's important here to sustain some type of drive, particularly when you have it so deep in your own territory, and again, you're just two scores behind. I say just, but with Hunter's potential and his ability to throw long, a touchdown pass may not be too far away if he gets the right coverage. Six minutes remaining in the third quarter of football. Boilers trying to pull just a little bit closer. Still deep in their own zone, though. And with Greg Farrell on the head of that big tackle, that'll put him a little bit deeper. Oh, boy, just a host of Indiana tacklers and nowhere but nowhere to go. It just shows you how far Indiana has come defensively. This is not a bad running attack right here. This is just a, a straight up the middle or run the tackle side if you can and look at the pursuit. Nobody home. Smickley did not get much to run with there. There's a good look at Hunter. What an athlete he is. Two of three, 28 yards. Coletto would like to see that athleticism shine through right now. He'll keep it, look to pass. Ernest Callaway wide open, 35. And up to about the 37 before he's finally hauled down by Jim Summerall. They just flashed Vaughn Dunbar's numbers on the scoreboard. Well over 100 yards, around 130 plus, 23 carries, one touchdown, but it was the fumble down at the goal line that has allowed Purdue to stay alive. Penalties and turnovers have hurt the Hoosiers on the year. Because instead of Indiana going up 31-9, or at the very least 27-9, now Purdue has the ball, decent field position, and has kept Indiana off the board. Forced two turnovers here in the second half. This is the second offensive possession for Purdue. Slipping, Hunter finally pitches to Jeff Hill. He's got room to run. Cross the midfield line, just about. Another first down. Out Jim Summerall again on the play. Enough for a first down. They should mark it at about the 50, 49 plus. You know, for a guy like Eric Hunter who has struggled with this offense, he's doing all the right things so far. He does slip right here, able to keep his keep his momentum and then pitch back to Hill. Look at all the wide open space. 13 yards on the play at the first and 10 renewed. Summerall Hagen over there on the play. Hill, 13 rushes, 71 yards. Looks like he might have twisted his knee a little bit. Seems to be in some pain. We'll check to see how quickly Jeff Hill gets back in the game. Hunter back to pass on first down. Looking, finding a great catch by Tedman Brown. Inside the 30-yard line. Now all of a sudden we have ourselves a football game, Michael. Well, that's what we hoped for. When Indiana had an opportunity to put the Boilermakers away, Hoosiers couldn't do it. And now Hunter in midfield is starting to operate. This is just a super catch. The transfer from Texas Southern, Tedman Brown. What a, what a luxury the Boilermakers have, not only with that receiver, but with Hunter and Pike next year battling for the same spot. They've got a lot of horses coming back. They lose Bobby Dressel, their big center. That hurts on the offensive line. This doesn't hurt when you can pick up eight or nine on first down. A Purdue touchdown here makes this very much a football game. 
That was Lewis Michael with the run. Mike Middleton on the tackle. This drive started deep in Purdue territory, now is deep in Indiana territory. Started on the four yard line. And they've already been able to pick up close to 80 yards on this drive. Measure for the first down and he's got it. You know, I know it's cold outside, Mike, but a lot of people left here at halftime. At least on the opposite side that we're at, and uh, they may have wished they had stuck around because this one ain't over. They better have a satellite dish in their car. Yeah. <laughs> or again, folks, if you're watching our replay, then you're enjoying it right now, and you didn't miss too much. You stayed warm. Good football game, 4-0-1, remaining in the third quarter. Purdue driving. Hills right back in the football game, and inside the 10-yard line. Probably another first down. What a terrific drive this is by the Boilermakers. And again, their passing game is starting to open up the run again because it opens up the field. It spreads the field. It makes the linebackers, it makes the down linemen aware that you might throw the football. And instead of first down the run, and look at the hole for Jeff Hill. A gain of 11 on the play. It is another first down. And Purdue is making it look easy right now. They're getting 10, 11 yards a pop. Two runs, two first downs. First and goal on the six. 345. Going in motion. Finkel finally to give to the big man, Arley Connors. He might have got one or two on the play. You know the way Connor checked out the way uh, Hunter hides the football. Might not be bad to try a bootleg here too. Or he might send somebody into the line. They ran that, what, 23 sucker play last week against Michigan State. It was Pike that ran it. But send somebody in the line and just toss a soft one in the end zone for a score or even keep the ball. Second and goal. Bill Mallory, wonder what he's thinking right now. I don't think we want to know. 24-6 at halftime. It's 24-9. Purdue first, second and goal on the four. First time they got the football, they score. Second time they have it, they may do it again. Connors again, bowls his way to about the two. John Miller on the stop for the Hoosiers. No secret here, it's four down territory. You won't settle for your field goal regardless of what happens here on third down. And this is probably the biggest play today. Coming up. They're gonna spot it just outside the one yard line. Call it third and goal from the one. The big men, Arlie Connors, he's the fullback, Jeff Hill the tailback. Three men in the backfield. Jim Summerall and a host of red jerseys smushed him in the backfield. You have to go for it here. Field goal means nothing. And a conservative call for the Boilermakers. They might have seen something. But look at the surge of the Indiana defense. He had nowhere to run. And now on fourth down, a running play is not in order. Maybe a bootleg. Maybe some type of uh, rollout pass. Something other than up the middle or off tackle. Loss of two, fourth and, fourth and goal on the three. Big play. And there'll be a timeout called by Hunter. And we'll take one here, too, from Memorial Stadium. Purdue with a fourth and goal situation. What will happen? You'll see after the break. Indiana leads it 24-9. You know, I can't imagine anybody going home from this game. Of course, I'm a diehard football fan. I stick around. I could see hiding somewhere during halftime and getting warm, but yeah, going home, forget it. 
Actually, it's this finger and my feet. That's about it. Other than that, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'm sure all the people at the parties all around the country are real ones. Situation is fourth and goal from the three yard line. Indiana leading 24 to 9. Eric Hunter inserted to start the second half as quarterback. Starting this offensive drive at the four yard line. Three men in the backfield. One goes in motion. Hunter to keep and throw. Touchdown, Purdue. The freshman, Ryan Grigson, with the touchdown, made his first collegiate reception last week, and a big touchdown right there on fourth and goal. We have ourselves a football game. What a terrific drive, some 96 yards. Hunter with the quick fake. There's 84, out of your picture, and back in it. Hagan just about got that ball, but nonetheless, a touchdown for the big freshman. Not a Highland. And they will go for two. And he was converted from a tackle to a tight end, as a matter of fact. Was Grigson. Plays a little tackle once in a while. The two-point conversion would make this a seven-point football game. Purdue getting set. Hill goes in motion. Hunter, big hit from Farrell, gets the pass away. Conversion attempt, no good. Incomplete pass. Which is interesting because now they still trail by nine. Yes, it, it might not have been a bad idea to go for the extra point and then a possession plus two ties it. But I think Coletto's thinking right here at a nice drive. It's only three yards away. And I'm not playing for a tie anyway. I'm playing to win here. Another thing Coletto's thinking with a minute 27 in the third quarter, they're back in this football game. Purdue scores on their first two possessions of the second half and have pulled it within 24 to 15. Yeah. Boy, Dunbar's fumble has turned things around. One twenty-seven remains in the third quarter. Still a lot of football to be played here. The annual battle for the old Oaken Bucket. Annually is a great football game. It's turning back into one now. Dunbar from his own three. Over the 20, hit by a couple of boilers. Football fumbled, and Purdue looks like they have it. Did he fumble again? Matt Kingsbury with a big hit on Vaughn Dunbar. Purdue was motioning they had the football. They do. And they do. Oh, my. Vaughn Dunbar. Man, did he get rocked, though, on that hit. Kevin Strickland with a big hit. Kingsbury looks like the man who came up with the football. Whack. Helmet on the football right there. Look at the field position at the 25-yard line of Indiana. Watch the hit right here. He gets his helmet right on the football. And there it pops three. Hey, this is turning out to be a terrific football game, Mike. Four Indiana turnovers. Two fumbles, two interceptions, three in the second half. First and 10 from the 25. Hill gets stopped behind the line of scrimmage. He'll lose two or three. Keep in mind that Indiana leads by nine. Purdue needs two possessions to go ahead. So the Boilermakers can, uh, by all accounts, if they get close enough, settle for a field goal and get within a touchdown or less. The way they're moving the ball in the second half, they have to feel like they've got plenty of time. Less than a minute remaining in the third quarter. We are lost. But they have moved it with some ease here in the second half. Number nine, Eric Hunter is the difference so far in the second half. And, of course, the two Dunbar fumbles. Loss of three on that play. Second and 13. Hunter back to pass. Look at the run. A lot of room. 
first down. He just saw that hole for a split second and darted. Finally brought down on the play by Mike Middleton, but not until he gets another Purdue first down. And that's where he's so dangerous, Jim. You'll see a lot of open space for 102 as everybody drops back in coverage. The pursuit goes to the right. Hunter runs to the left. And a first down, down to the Indiana 12. How this game has changed. First and 10 from the 12. Hunter, give to Hill. Hill inside the 10-yard line, down to the 9. And that's going to end the period. If you're talking about a quarter that belonged to the Golden Black, you talk about the third quarter here. They went into the locker room, trailing by 18. They've cut the lead in half. They trail by nine after three quarters of play. We're going to have a dandy in the fourth quarter. Purdue knocking at the door. Turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. We talked about it. Coletto's got a lot to be proud of. He said his team would fight. He, he knew that. He said his team would come out and fight. Well, I had that stat on turnovers. There were seven of them by way of Purdue last year. Stay warm, gentlemen. Only one more quarter. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. How many turnovers are you now? Four? Mm -hmm. Two for Purdue. Jim Barber back at the house here in Bloomington Memorial Stadium. Purdue second and seven from the nine. A lot of movement in front, but a good surge by Purdue. And keep in mind, Indiana, rather, Purdue doesn't need to get a touchdown here. A field goal makes it 24 18, gets them within winning this football game within a touchdown. So they don't have to go for it on fourth down unless it's fourth and one and they really want to try to ram it home. But they're, the momentum has switched and the black and gold is in pretty good position right here to really get close. When we talked earlier, Jim, about did they need to go for it when they kicked the field goal to make it from six to nine, now it looks like they didn't. Jim Coletto knew exactly what was going on. Third and four from the six. Right up the middle, close to a first down. Number 33, Houston Malden on the carry. Brings up an interesting decision right here on fourth down. Looks like to be about a yard short. Now what do you do? I don't see anybody coming in from the sideline. Namely a guy named Joe O'Leary. And they're gonna go for it on fourth and two. On fourth and goal. They scored a touchdown. Now it's fourth and two from the four. A lot of noise. Purdue looking for a timeout. Looked like Smickle was motioning for a timeout. It hasn't been an official indication yet. Hunter having a discussion. Yeah, Hunter says, I can't hear. And of course, the fans here won't make it any easier for him. I guess they're going to charge Purdue with a timeout. Yes, Mick will lift it up and uh, motion for the timeout. Yeah, and, and seeing in that particular spot, it would have been much wiser to let the crowd take over and then just step back and wait until the official makes them play. 
We'll take a timeout too while Jim Coletto and Purdue discuss what they're going to do on a fourth and two from the four, trailing by nine. We were away. Jim Coletto, after the timeout, changed his mind. He's going to go for three here and say that they can score again. O'Leary should be a chip shot. A 21-yarder for Joe O'Leary. He missed it. Badly. Wasn't a bad decision, just wasn't a good kick. They've had trouble this year, too. Yes, they have. Look You're right, it, it wasn't the close. Zone. It was not close. Yeah, just never got the ball down in position, and this one is wide left. No, way, way wide. I'll tell you what, looked like there was confusion on the set, too. Snap maybe was inside. But nonetheless, there you see Jim Coletto. Mm, they moved the ball so well, he's saying, we can't come away with any points. Maybe he's not saying it as calmly as I just did, though. <laughs> so Indiana dodges a bullet there. They get the football on the 20-yard line. And now that we're in the fourth quarter, it's interesting to note that Indiana has been incredible in the fourth quarter. They've outscored their opposition 92-43. to So this is indeed where they want to be. They still have an advantage in the sense of two possessions is what Purdue needs to get back in this game. O'Leary is just, uh, he's had a tough day. Missed a 17-yarder. Made a four-yarder. He has had a tough day. Green, back to pass. Uh-oh. Intercepted. Uh-oh. Brought down at the 26-yard line, intercepted by Kevin Strickland. Sometimes you wonder if Indiana really wants to win this football game. They Fumbling at the goal over. line of Purdue, throwing a, a pass here, and it's picked off. This is the fifth Indiana turnover. And I'll tell you what, Green either misread the coverage or a receiver was out of place because this is right to Strickland. Makes a great play. Then runs with it like it's a loaf of bread. I think he was looking at the He bottom. was, wasn't he? He was. Uh, don't do that. Take another look at it from Trent Green's angle. Stepped right in front of McGowan. On the 26 yard line, Purdue back in the football game. I'll tell you what. Option Hunter with a pitch to Hill. Hill cuts, has a good block, gets a first down. Last year, Purdue dominated Indiana in the numbers. Outgained them 2-1 to one as you look at Hill, and let's hope he's okay. But he is in a lot of pain. The numbers went all the way up Purdue. Wallamakers just owned them up and down the field, but it was the turnovers that killed them. And speaking of turnovers, right now, that's hurting Indiana. The number was 7 a year ago. The final score was Indiana 28, Purdue 14. And the number right now is 5 for IU. Here's the replay on the option. Back to Hill. Good block downfield. Let's see where he twisted his knee. Right there. On the tackle by Miller. And that was the knee he was kind of trying to flex out before too, Jim. Can't afford a loss of him, obviously. Oh, he just got turned around. There it now. is. Mm. Still being attended to on the sideline. A couple of coaches helping him walk down. There you see right there. Oh, that's it's his right knee. That's too bad. And he's had a dandy football game, I'll tell you what. Hill carries to the 15 yard line. It marks at 10 for Purdue. Hill came in the leading Boilers rusher. Indiana four turnovers in their last four possessions, all here in the second half. That's consistency, but not the kind of consistency you're looking for. Unless, of course, you're a Purdue fan. 
So with the first down, the ball now on the 15-yard line of Indiana. Purdue, first and 10. After the miss by O'Leary, they still trail by nine. Hunter keeps the ball, rolls right. Couple of Hoosiers in pursuit. Hunter finally gets a pass away to Callaway. Touchdown! Tedman Brown. Eric Hunter made that play. Eric Hunter made that play. There is no way that a normal, everyday quarterback gets away to throw that pass. And Hunter doing his best, Fran Tarkington or Randall Cunningham, name a scrambling quarterback, if you will, made that play happen. And now it is 24-21 Indiana. They call him Little Randall, and you can see why. Shows the athletic ability. Tedman Brown with a big touchdown catch. 24-21, the point after, attempt by O'Leary. That is good. We got 12.06 remaining, a two-point football game. Purdue has been on a tear. 16 unanswered points here in the second half. Indiana leads it by a deuce. IU fans wondering what happened. They go into the locker room, 24 to six. It's now 24-22, 12.06 remaining in the football game. Von Dunbar deep. Last time he got the ball, a fumble was forced. He's got to hold on to the football, Mike. They'll kick away. And it'll bounce a little bit, finally roll into the end zone. And that might be the best thing that happened. You know, a couple of years ago, the Boilermakers upset Indiana here 15-14. That, too, was a come-from-behind effort. And the thing about the momentum in this football game, it's all toward Purdue. The final touchdown that they get, watch the athletic work of Hunter. He almost gets tripped up in the backfield. Look at the pursuit. Now one fake, now another fake. And by that time, it allows his receiver to get open, and there he is. Tedman Brown, his second touchdown of the year. I love watching Eric Hunter play. Hoosiers will start it off. First and 10 from their own 20. In desperate need of some points. And a drive that'll eat up some of this clock. Give to Dunbar. He stops, cuts back. Gets up to about the 23. Now the only thing we can make an indication of here is the fact that the Boilermakers have only one timeout left. You're saying, hey, there's 11.55 to go in the game, so what? Well, that is important because Boilermakers still trail. They may need to stop the clock. They may need to get a last second drive, and they only have one time to do it. Dunbar with well over 100 yards rushing on the day. The second in the nation in rushing average. Green passes. Short. He tripped coming out of the snap. It's very important here for Indiana not to play scared. And if the Hoosiers are tentative or scared, it will be their undoing. The graphic you saw earlier is most indicative of what's happened in the second half. The last four Indiana possessions, four turnovers. It's only human nature, Michael, that you start to think, hey, maybe we can't move the ball. Maybe we can't be a little gutsy like we were in the first half. And if that man runs into that particular problem with this football team and the rest of his players, uh, they're in trouble. Hoosiers on the sideline cheering on the offense. The defense has spent a lot of time on the field here in the second half. Looks like an audible on the part of Green. Third and six. Purdue showing blitz. Purdue jumped. But they're pointing at a lot of IU guys. A lot of IU guys are pointing at Purdue guys. I thought somebody from Purdue jumped, but we'll see. Looks like it's going to go against the Hoosiers. The momentum in this game has swung 180 degrees. And if oh. Indiana is starting start. to play scared, Simulang is starting to play on the offense. They're in trouble. 
Watch the replay. The movement on the line will look sharp. Okay, you see the what the tackle that pulled yep. back there? Yep. It was Sean Harper. Here's a big play, third and eleven. Can you believe this? Purdue once down 18 points. With a stop here, we'll have a chance to go ahead. Third and eleven from the 19. This is an important play. And it's overthrown. Green he couldn't get a hold of it. I'm sorry, Mike. Green has lost something here in the second half, and it is confidence. He's not even close to his receivers. His two interceptions were, were decent catches, but really were bad throws. Boilermakers get great field position. 11.26 left. Got a great chance to go ahead. And Eddie looked to be open on that play. The confidence level between Green and Hunter is a world of difference right now. Back deep for the Boilers, Ernest Callaway. Punt looks like it may have been partially blocked. Either that or he just didn't get it off too well. There was a lot of pressure in there on the punter. Man, oh man, how the tides have turned and the Boilers are on offense once again, trailing by two, 11 minutes plus remaining in the football game. on the offensive starting at their own 45 yard line Hunter keeps looking downfield has a receiver Ernest Callaway down near the 36 yard line it looks like a different football team the punt too gives them a great opportunity for good field position let's see if anybody did get to this or not Jim I don't think so no he just didn't get it off very well did he the Hoosiers have been struggling in the punting game Bill Mallory has talked about that all week and look at where the football is at the 11 minutes left in the game the Boilermakers down two and they have made things happen after the turnovers two touchdowns one field goal they had the opportunity for the field goal the other time and that's the thing, turning the turnovers into points. If you don't do that, the turnovers don't mean a whole heck of a lot. They have meant a lot here. Smickle breaking tackles inside the 30, near the 26, finally pushed out of bounds. Another Purdue first down. If you're just joining us, this is a shocker, simply from the fact that Indiana led 24-6 at the break at halftime, had a long drive going to start the second half. Then a fumble seemed to turn things around. And Hunter, the confidence himself, and look at his running back right there. Nearly stopped in the backfield. Gets a nice block from behind. Might have been a clip, but just the same. Enough for a first down, and they are now getting close to field goal range and the lead. Mose Richardson forces him out of bounds. A nice play by Smickle. He froze Scott Montoya there. And it'll be first and 10 from the 20. 10.46 remaining in the game. Smickle again, right up the middle. He'll get a couple. Indiana could use a turnover right here. The Copper Bowl's at stake, a trip to Tucson, Arizona. Indiana doesn't go unless Indiana wins. It's as simple as that. A successful season is probably at stake, too. You don't want to think pessimistically if you're an Indiana fan, but they talk so much about jumping into that upper echelon. Now, granted, they played Iowa, Ohio State, Michigan, Notre Dame all on the road. They knew that would be tough, but they do have to figure they beat a team like Purdue. Purdue is already, in, in a lot of people's estimation, after last year had a successful season. But this would be, in all retrospect, a great season if they could pull off this upset under Jim Coletta. No timeouts left now for the Boilermakers. Keep that in mind. They're going to talk about it a little bit. They don't want to make any mistakes here. As the clock continues to roll, Purdue trails by two. They're looking to take the lead.
<laughs> alumni, that, that's Jim talking about Fort Knox, so everybody knows that. <laughs> this is this is stunning. Unbelievable. I mean, Indiana just owned Purdue in the first half. Yeah, as Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again. Jim, as you mentioned, no timeouts now for the Boilermakers. They have a second and eight on the 18th. Indiana has all three timeouts remaining. Pitch back to Arlie Connors. Connors to about the 12. Flag on the play. Late flag, I think. But it's going to be against Purdue a hold. Tackle was made on by Paul Williams, but the hold is really a big play if you're a Hoosiers fan. Also the fact that Purdue special teams, their kicking game suffers in terms of field goals. They've really got to get awfully close or maybe punch home a touchdown here because even a short. Pulling on the offense, behind the end of the run, 10-yard penalty, spot foul. Even a short field goal seems to be an adventure for the Boilermakers. Has been today, that's for sure. So they step it off from the point of the foul, and that makes it second and 17, ball on the 27. They got to get to the 10 yard line of Indiana. And there's the guy that could get him there. If he's trying to make a statement for Jim Coletto to think about for the months ahead before they go to spring practice, he is doing so today. He's their big play quarterback. Second and 17. Just under 10 minutes remain. They give to Smickle. He gets up near the 21. Not sure I understand the call. Um, because you need to get to the 10-yard line, but they must have enough confidence to pick up the 11 yards and the two downs that remain. Of course, you try to catch people off, off guard with a draw. Or play of that nature. Mark Coletto has done a terrific job in his football game of getting Purdue back in it. Six-yard game for big number 43. There's big number nine leading the charge. They need 11 for a first down from the 21. If he gets a rush, look for him to improvise. They don't even take a chance of it. Conservative call there. Big play made in the backfield by Bochamp. You know, unless they're playing for a field goal here, I don't understand that either. Either, And apparently they are going to go for three. Now, is this O'Leary again? They must figure they can do it. Actually, check that. Larry McDaniel with the big play here. Well, it's, it's 19 out there, I believe. So it's O'Leary. It's a straight-on shot. It'll be a 40-yard attempt for Joe O'Leary. He missed badly on his last attempt, but it would give Purdue the lead. The kick is up. Uh -uh. Kicking game. Yep, those special teams. Still a lot of time left in the football game, but no timeouts remaining for the Boilermakers. And of course, there's no two-minute warning in college football, so they can not stop it. Indiana's been dodging some major bullets. I'll tell you what, it's about time they start shooting themselves. If Purdue gets the ball back, still down by two points or five, if Indiana gets a field goal, they must try to score. Of course, they, they're down five, a touchdown they, they need to get, but their kicking game is not making it. So they're going to have to go for the touchdown. Tough, tough day for Joe O'Leary. IU starts at their own 23. Dunbar, left side. Little juke move. Gets up to about the 29. Every first down, Mike, eats up a couple of minutes. Depending how, depending how quickly you get it. You know, six yards here eats up 45 seconds, and it becomes a game of possession. If Purdue doesn't get the ball back, very simply, Indiana wins and goes to Tucson. And you don't want to give the ball back to Eric Hunter. I thought Purdue was too conservative on that drive. Indiana gets a touchdown and the point after. So ball make game. It 31-22 ball game. Dunbar. Should be close to a first down. Dunbar carrying once again. 
The tackle made by number 55, Eric Beattie. Eric Beattie makes the tackle for the Boilers. Right here, Vaughn's just I'm saying to himself, hey, if we can win this football game, the turnovers are forgotten. I have a big day, rush for over 150 yards, and we're going bowling. Mm -hmm. We'll find out very soon where that was going to go for the next year. You know what? At halftime, I think everybody said it was staying right in Bloomington. And when Hunter got a couple of touchdowns, a couple of those links were starting to come unglued. They've been playing for the Oaken Bucket since 1925. This man, Bill Mallory, has won this game the last three out of four years. The series began a hundred years ago with Purdue winning in Lafayette, 60 to nothing. The 94th meeting between the two teams overall of 57, 30, and six edge goes to the Golden Black. Third and less than one here. Indiana needs to get this to kill some clock. Green on the keeper. I think he got it. Yeah, I think he'll the be fine. Number 12, Trent Green. The Boilermakers, again, have no timeouts remaining. What that means is they can't stop the clock. What that means is Indiana with a couple, three first downs here, depending on how they get it, if they use up all their downs, can hang on to the ball and win the football game. So the, the burning of the three timeouts, while one or two may have been okay, you, you've got to have something left at the end of the game, Mike. 6.54 and counting. Dunbar, left side. Brought down from behind on the play by Jimmy Schwantz. And it's important for Indiana to keep the ball in play. I, I suppose that goes without saying, but if you can, you don't want to get it strung out to one side or the other and get knocked out of bounds. You want the clock to continue to run, and now we're down to 6.30, and again, Indiana with the football at its own 37, just trying to hang on. 27 carries, 147 yards on the day for Vaughn Dunbar. His average is 154 plus some change. Two receivers far side. Three burners in all on a second and six play for IU. And Green will look to pass. Chased by three Boilermakers, uh -oh. chased big time. Finally gets it away to Dunbar, one hopper in front of him. But Trent did a good job in just finding Vaughn and avoiding a huge loss. Yes, he did a good job of spinning away. We've talked so much about Eric Hunter and his ability to avoid the rush. There, Trent Green prevented maybe a 20, 25-yard loss. He just kept going backwards, and when you go backwards, only bad things can happen. Of course, at that time, he was running for survival. He was being chased on the play by Big Peyton Minter. Now the clock stops. That's in Purdue's favor here, and this is a big play in the game. Third and six. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you, there have been more big plays than you think, though. 16 for 29 for Trent Green on the day. Third and six for the Indiana Hoosiers. Green back to pass. Coleman cannot hold on. This has not been a terrific second half for Indiana. There have been drop balls. There have been fumbles. There have been interceptions. They're still stuck on the number 24. And now Purdue gets the ball back with 5.53 left and a chance to go ahead and very possibly win the bucket game. And again, Purdue win keeps Indiana at home for holidays. Callaway sneaking up to Julio to punt. Gets away a good one. He needed to. From his own 28, Callaway on the return. Breaks a couple of tackles. He's loose. And over the midfield line. And a flag. Or no, yes, two flags. Callaway made a dandy move back around the 31, 32 yard line. And next thing you know, Purdue starts off after we see how the outcome of the penalty is, possibly in Indiana territory. Was there a clip or was there a late hit? Turned by the returning team. It does go against the Purdue Boilermakers. It was a low block before the below the waist on the Boilermakers. Just for Purdue to get into position to win this game is remarkable, considering the first half numbers we saw. Blocking below the waist on the return team. And the first half domination by Indiana. And again, begin the second half, IU had a chance to wrap it up and fumble. Let's see if we can catch the block. There 
there it is right there. Jimmy Young. Jimmy Young, yep. And what a difference that makes because now Purdue starts on their own 33 where they would have started on the Indiana 48. Yes. Five minutes, 40 seconds remain. If you're just joining us, it was 24 to 6, Indiana at halftime. Big hit, incomplete pass. John Miller, a junior out of Maslin, Ohio, played extremely well last week against Ohio State in Ohio Stadium. It may be a little early to look this far ahead, but what happens if there is a fourth down? Still plenty of time left. If it's short yardage, what do you do? You don't have any timeouts left. So you have to think in terms of keeping the football. Miller coming out of the game, holding that right arm, Jim, that yes. he was holding earlier in the football contest. But he keeps telling himself, this is a bucket game. I'm coming back in. Second and 10. Hunter back to pass again. Creeping out of the backfield. Smickle makes a move. Gets up near the 40. Still going. Still on his feet. He'll be about three yards shy of a first down. Clock moving, 5.20. A seven-yard play there puts him at third and three. An opportunity the Boilers need to take advantage of with no timeouts and five minutes exactly, now 4.59 remaining in the football contest. They're on their feet at the house. Cheering on the defense here, third and three. From the 40. Blitz. Hunter has plenty of time. Now rolling back, settling. Way incomplete. Indiana defense holds, at least for now. Hunter did a good job of getting rid of that ball because nobody was home, and they were sending an extra backer to try to put some heat on him. Watermakers will give up the ball. Still time left. Although, to be honest with you, if I was out there. <laughs> but it's safe to say up here, isn't it, my friend? Yeah, and they're, they're guys that do this job uh, coaching much better than I would. With 438, again, as you mentioned, the only thing that worries you a little bit is the lack of timeouts. But you've got a great punter in Eric Brune. You hope you can gain some field position, maybe even in the transfer of the football. Brune's kick will not even be fielded by McGowan. Will it roll into the end zone? Yes. Not by a whole lot. And with the lack of timeouts, I know it sounds like we're beating a dead horse, but two first downs by Indiana could wrap it up. 428 remains in the football game. A trip to a bowl game for the Hoosiers on the line. They lead by two. They have the football. Numbers offensively in the second half for Indiana have not been good at all. The only number that is uh, real, real high is turnovers. They need to establish something here. Vaughn breaks off two tackles in the backfield, but a lot of gold and black around him. And Don Delvey caught up with him before he could do any damage. Don Delvey was an attacker at number 44. Boilermakers with a stop right here, and important, even though they couldn't wrap up Dunbar the first time, to gang tackle him without any type of gain. In fact, the loss of one, and these next two big plays for Indiana, they need a first down. He was hit initially in the backfield by number 75, Eric Gray. A loss of one on the play, second and 11, 350 remain. Green looking to pass. Just a dump off to Dunbar, bounces out of his hand. This has not been Vaughn Dunbar's second half. I mean, this is not the Dunbar that some people project to be very possibly the top pick in the draft. It almost seems like it's a mental thing right now. You know, holding on to the football, catching the football. And that brings up a tough play at third and 11. Indiana, their last six possessions, two interceptions, two fumbles, two punts, as opposed to 24 points in the first half. Yes, 0 for 6, if you will including one really long drive in that first half. The Boilermakers get a stick here. They get good field position off the punt. 3.43, the clock is stopped at. Green on third and 11. 
Cutting right through the middle. Didn't get it. But way short of the first down. Didn't get the times. first down. We're setting up for one of those college football fantastic finishes, partner. You got that right. Watching the Boilermaker end zone on the far side of the football field. That band and group of fans over there are getting pretty excited and with good right. To Julio back to punt. He needs a big punt. Callaway will field it on the 35. Callaway inside Indiana territory. Low punt, Callaway got a good return on it. Matt Egelhoff made the stop. Less than 50 yards away to a, I think a pretty big upset. Each Saturday night at 10 o'clock, it's the best in sports on Indiana Sports Tonight. All the sports important to you, our fans in central Indiana. That's each Saturday night, a new show. We just started it a couple of months ago. Fans, check it out for all your favorite teams. Each Saturday night, 10 o'clock, we'll have the highlights of this one tonight at 10. This one has aged Bill Mallory a couple of years. As it has all the alumni and all the fans of Indiana University. From, their own, from the 48. Smickle with a gain of about four. I don't think it's a bad idea for Purdue to go without a huddle. Paul Williams with the stop. Because you have no timeouts remaining, the only time the clock will stop is when there's an out-of-bounds play or an incompleted pass. And you're looking at 2.30. You see the clock in the corner of your screen, 2.30 and counting. Ball on the 45, second and seven. The fans chanting defense. A lot of men coming right now. Hunter gets it off. Smickle with Look the out. catch. Look out to the 40. Inside the 30, down near the 25 yard line. John Miller finally brought him down. What a game this young man is coming in play. Look at the pressure by Indiana. They sent everybody, and that's the danger sometimes if you don't get to the quarterback. Ball at the Indiana 26, not in field goal position. I'll tell you what, I wonder what that is right now. Yeah, so if you're so a Purdue fan. Under two minutes. As Jim mentioned, no two-minute warning in college football. We are under two minutes in the football game. First and 10 on the 26 for the Boilermakers. Give to the man with the hot hands, Mickle. Bulls his way ahead, still hasn't been brought down. About seven yards later, Mose Richardson with the play. My Ola, if you're just joining us, 24-6 at halftime. Now 24-22, and to put it simply, Purdue playing for the bucket. They're calling it a gain of nine, second and one from the 17. O'Leary, man, oh man, it's like we said about Vaughn Dunbar, if IU wins, O'Leary makes a field goal to win it, everything is forgotten. He is the hero. He and number nine, Eric Hunter. No timeouts remain, 109 and counting. Second and one on the 17. Hit at the line of scrimmage hard. By Larry McDaniel was Arlie Connors. What's interesting here is if Purdue runs for the first down and doesn't get it, they've got to do one of two things. They've got to try for the first down again or quickly bring on the field goal kicker, 45 seconds and running. So they've got to make things happen here quickly. 38 seconds remain. They will need to get the, they might stop the clock on this play. It'll be interesting to see because there is not a lot of time left. 30 seconds. Hunter, he yep. does indeed stop the clock. And I don't think Hunter's real happy either. He's screaming at his running back right now. But I'll tell you what, what do you do? You don't get the first down. Even if you do get the first down, well, first down, of course, would have stopped the clock. But you don't get the first down there. You probably don't get your kickoff, your field goal team, on the field, Jim. It'll be a 35-yard attempt. You know what they say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. There you see the numbers for O'Leary. A 35-yard attempt with 28 seconds left to give Purdue a one-point lead.
Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't have any left. It's, it's these guys over here. They'll, the, they'll and we'll take a timeout too. 28 seconds remain in the football game. Purdue with a field goal attempt to try to take the lead. He's the man of the hour right now. Joe O'Leary from 35 yards out. He's missed three on the day. This would be the biggest of his career if he can get it. And again, a timeout. So Indiana has basically boiled it down to the field goal. Even though they'll have three timeouts left, they're I think they're conceding the idea that if he nails this one, history. So they want to put as much pressure on him as possible. That's an interesting point you make right there because with 28 seconds left, a couple of seconds will knock off the clock for a field goal. You get a good return. You've got three timeouts. You might have a couple of chances to get three, four plays of yes. 12 to 15 yards. Not anymore. It's all about this, folks. It happened two years ago. IU needing a win to go to the Freedom Bowl. We're upset here in the house 15 14 anthony thompson senior year this is now von dunbar senior year he wants to go to a bowl game it could again be a one point purdue victory oh larry appears to be confident about hitting this one of course we don't know until he tries it but he came out of the field quickly as if hey let me try it again i can redeem myself and that's the key right there he has a chance to let's see what happens Folks at home, watch. He missed it. Indiana's going bowling. Missed it well wide. There's the bucket. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Look at the Boilermakers sideline. Really didn't expect to be in a position to win it, but what's so heartbreaking about it is has had several chances to do just that, win it. That tells the story right there, folks. Indiana will just run out the clock now. Purdue with no timeouts. Great football game, Mike. Indeed it was. Gosh, give credit to Purdue, huh? Yep. What a comeback in the second half. Three opportunities to win. They couldn't pull it off, and the bucket will stay in Bloomington. And the team will be practicing for Tucson, Arizona. And tough luck for that man. And happiness on the sideline. Add another eye to the ring. To say Indiana dodged a bullet would be the understatement of the year. The Hoosiers keep the bucket, the final score from Memorial Stadium. Indiana 24, Purdue 22. Goals did he miss? Four? How many field goals did he miss on the day? Four? Just that's how we're at. Five? Well, he came in only six of ten in field goal attempts. You know what? One, he did not even make a field goal of over 30 yards during the year. 
That's what I was trying to find, that stat. You know, it's, it is strange to not, on, on a major college football program, to not have a field goal. I mean, that's a shame. Yeah, that it, is it really is a shame. Because they were in position to win. Of course, there was some confusion on that third down play. Uh, maybe if they'd gotten another first down, maybe they'd take another crack at it. You know, well, you get the first the down, and the clock, the clock stops while they reset the chains, mm -hmm. and then it starts rolling again. That would probably have been enough time, yeah. but I don't know if you get another offensive play off there. So what do you do? Do you go? Maybe you go end zone. That's the thing. Yeah. On third and two, you go end zone. You figure you're going to have a completion or an interception, especially when the man hasn't made over a 35-yard field goal. You know, they had a lot of confidence in him. I mean, they kept putting him back out there. They must have thought, well, it's law of averages. He's going to hit one of them. Hey, Jerry, you'll call for the closed billboard copy, right, my friend? over the public television stations in the state. You'll be able to hear Coach Mallory on the Bill Mallory College show this next week. And of course, if you want to, go to the Spencer on the evening party on County Park today. It's a Memorial Stadium. Once again, we look at our athletic schedule tomorrow. Very full day for Indiana. All right, well, we have a graphic on that. Uh, okay. 12.30 p.m. NCAA soccer. Second round action. Indiana against Wisconsin. Third time for the year of the Tuesday Sun. Indiana. No Jerry Wheatley credit. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> Hope all the alums enjoyed it. I'll tell you what, we had fun calling it. Big time. Big time. I wanted to see how you go to a bowl game, but as Purdue kept hammering away, you wanted it for Coletto. I mean, man, oh man. Yeah, you know. I'm being careful right now with all the alums. Oh, and I understand. But I'll tell you what, I think most alums agree that, that probably Purdue, Purdue deserved to win this at the end. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they just controlled everything in the second half. And, and I, maybe Indiana did get tentative. Well, if, it's, if there can be a win win situation here, sure. Purdue goes home. I mean, rather than winning, they have to feel great. And then Indiana gets to go to a bowl game. A three point loss to Minnesota, two point loss to IU keeps them from six and five. Gosh, what a wild finish. Oof. This is a... I'll throw it, I'll say that. Purdue finishes their season four and seven, but they were oh so close. Sure. To really seven and four, right? Uh, three two-point losses? The three-point loss to Minnesota, the two-point loss to um, Indiana. What was the other? They got blown out by Cal and Notre Dame. And they got blown out. They got beat by Iowa by about ten. Okay. So they were. We still have the fighting coaches with Indiana are Indiana. There it goes. Ooh. Ooh. That thing's heavy once it comes down. <laughs> the goal post coming down here. That's nice and warm. You know, it's odd. I thought it was O'Leary that kicked the winning field goal on the road at Northwestern, like with seconds or been. I'm sure it was. Um, unless they've had another kicker this year. Man, oh man. That was wild. That was wild. Oof. I feel warmth, though. Warmth is minutes away. Well, you know, didn't they move the goalpost in two and a half yards? Yes, they sides? did, which is what they talked about so much on Florida State Miami. But he didn't miss any of those. He missed those on the old goalpost, too. On, on the last one? Was well, yeah, I think so. It looked like on most of them, he missed them on the old. Is why Florida State is not playing for a national championship now. Yep. Stays in Bloomington, but for a while there, it did not look like that was going to happen, Jim. Well, a lot of smiling faces on the sidelines, Mike, with the just a dramatic finish. O'Leary had a chance to win it. We'll show you how close he From outside of 30 yards all season long, that could have all been forgotten if he could have got this 35-yarder to go. 
But even on the new NFL size yep. crossbars, wasn't close. it was far, far away, and they're smiling here in Bloomington. Is that an Indiana fan or a Purdue fan? I guess an Indiana fan. Huh? It's probably an Indiana fan who aged that second half <laughs> as tough as this game was. That wasn't Bill Mallory, was it? No, indeed. But they are going bowling. Now, folks, join us tomorrow at 1.30 for the Indiana Sports Tonight pregame show with myself and Ted Kitchell. Then stay tuned for Hoosier Basketball as Indiana takes on the Soviet national team with the tip-off with Chuck Marlowe and John Laskowski at 2 o'clock, followed by Indiana Sports Tonight, the post-game show, all live from Assembly Hall here in Bloomington. Again, your final score from the house. Indiana beats Purdue by a final of 24-22. to 22. This game has been brought to you in part by Farm Bureau Insurance and the more than 600 Farm Bureau insurance agents across Indiana and by INB Banking Centers, where we give you the feeling of success. The following has been a copyrighted telecast of WTTV.